Here's Halliburton into the front court. Mishandled it, but gets a shot. Hits it! Hits it! John, I have never been better to be on the air with you here in Indianapolis, a place where so many of my dreams have come true. The Ride with JMV on 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. Uh, we got a lot to get to. I would suggest we do it. Thank you guys for joining us. Thanks for being here as always. James in studio. I am John. We'll give you the guest list coming up in just a bit. I did mention in the crosstalk with Quarry and Company here that I think Trace is going to be on the show, but we don't know if and when that is going to happen at some point, maybe late. So we shall see. Well, we got a good one lined up for you, of course. A lot of Pacer coverage considering the Rockets and the Pacers coming up at the Fieldhouse later on tonight. I will say this, when these guys are getting healthy, as we see, when these guys, Tyrese Halliburton, starts getting the minutes, as we see, this would be what we like to call a nice little bump. If you're able to start stringing together some wins prior to the NBA All-Star break, Nice little bump, little feel-good story right there. And believe me, as I've said, there's a reason you go back to Thursday in New York and how disappointed I was. And then people say on Friday, hey, you're completely overreacting. There's a lot of season to go. Well, great. I'm glad there's a lot of season to go. But you can also take advantage of situations that are incredibly winnable even when you're not at the end of the season. It all doesn't have to take place at the end. That's always been my issue with everybody making fun of me about the Colts. And wait a minute, a September must win? Yes, you have games of value, especially in the NFL. The games are so important. Then you find yourself begging once you get into mid-December. Nah, you don't want to be begging. You want to take care of that right now. A lot of things to take care of when you think about it. Think about this. The tale of two teams in the Eastern Conference right now. The Cleveland Cavaliers, who look just stratospherically different for the good now than what we had witnessed early in the season. You know, whether you're talking about injuries to Allen or Mobley or getting used to that, or um, I think they had Darius Garland also was dinged up. They are, they're playing the style of winning basketball that I would like to see the Pacers try to put together and replicate here. And then you see, on the other hand, the Philadelphia 76ers, you have zero idea where this thing is going to go. You know, they send out the signals to Adrian Wojnarowski and to Shams about how they got their fingers crossed and their hope that he's going to be good to go at least at some point before the end of the season. But there's a lot going on there right now without Joel Embiid, and there's a lot to be taken advantage of. And again, where you're sitting, take advantage of it. If you're the Pacers, starting tonight, Houston's a really good team, a very young and athletic team. The Pacers already own a win over the Rockets. Young and athletic, though. No Fred Van Vliet later on tonight. Take care of it. Take care of it before you get Golden State on Thursday. Do the same there, and then you're off and playing some road games. Yeah, give yourself and the fan base a little bit of a bump before the All-Star break. Give everybody reason to have something to talk about right here. Because I think right now everybody is still kind of on the fence. See you, Jake. On the fence about, all right, I like what they've done. I like Siakam. But the the results, if you say mixed results, I guess what sounds better is the results are 50-50 by now. I mean, you're kind of even Steven with it. Lose three, win three, whatever. Win one. (laughs) But no, give everybody a reason to get on the other side of the all-star break. Have some fun around here, whether you're going to the game, you had that type of cash. Maybe going to a party, going to a gathering, get together. And going to the... uh, Lucas Oil Stadium skills competition, all that's going to be going on there with the LED floors. I think that thing's going to look like my daughter's room. <laughs> how many How many of you have kids right now that like lights and LED lights are so popular, those little strips that you just kind of tack up to the wall? My daughter's room looks like Saturday Night Fever. I walk in there and I go, I, I kind of want to start doing my 
Tony Monero right here in the middle of your room floor. But no, after all that fun is to be had, which whatever you're going to do, fire things up and then show that the move that was made with Siakam is one that is going to work and then reach the bar that we have reset now. And I think rightly so. I guess what this comes down to as well is to start playing again a consistent level of basketball. Well, I shouldn't say again, but start playing a consistent level of basketball to where you now build a belief that something is going on. Because we've really handed out an ass load of excuses so far. Well, this guy's injured, that guy's injured. Well, this guy's new. They didn't have this, they didn't have that. And they had to go out west, and that was tough. All these games are tough. When you return from that West Coast six-gamer, you know, we had basically three right out of the gate, incredibly difficult. I mean, we're just handing out excuses here. And a lot of people out there are going to go, well, you know what, we're used to it with what people talk about in terms of the Colts. But no, now it's time to start proving it. And I think tonight's one of those games. And we have seen it's been all too familiar that this team just hasn't been what you would expect in some of these home games i mean hell i was disappointed on friday night against sacramento they got off to a good start and then basically the uh, three quarters after absolute mess become more consistent at home and we're just like searching for that against the good teams i checked that against the bad teams right But we're talking about good teams, average teams, whatever. Start to make your mark. Get this bump before the all-star break and then have at it. That's what you should be looking for. That's what Pacer fans should be looking for. In fact, that's what I'm looking for. That is beginning later on tonight. Alex Golden of setting the pace. (laughs) Everybody is sending me stuff about trading. Trade, trade, trade. Got to trade this and trade that. If you know that Buddy is not in your future, then how are you going to keep him right now? Well, I mean, it's twofold, I guess, because, hell, you're sitting in it right now. Maybe you need him right now. Well, he's not shooting well. you got to trade him. But what happens when – this is not like this goes away forever. He's not going to get the yips like Steve Sachs or Rick Ankiel all of a sudden just fade away to nothing. All right, he's in a slump right now, but he is, historically speaking, one of the better three-point shooters of all time. And he hasn't half-assed his way to that description. I mean, he's earned that description. I would tell you this, as I mentioned yesterday, and really, this is not an altogether new thought for me. And. Uh, it, it pains me, too, because I, I know defensively, once you get to the postseason, man, things things really get tight. I mean, you you get your offense gets put in a vice. It is different. Now, it's not 1990s different, but it's different. I just will tell you that this team cannot afford to continue to lose offensive momentum. I'm not looking for them to put up 140 every night, but you have to be offensively most nights a lot better and consistently a lot better than who you're going to play because, again, your defense, just simply put, is not going to catch up with it. Yeah, I don't care what you think about Andrew Nemhard in the starting lineup. Uh, Is he better defensively than Buddy Heald? Sure. Does he better offensively? I mean, there's a delicate balance there. And it's not just – we were talking to Chad Buchanan last week, and it's just not as easy to say, well, you know what? I don't know if this guy's in the future plan, so we got to trade him right now. I specifically asked Chad Buchanan, do you feel it because you have expiring contracts that you got to get something out of these guys before the trade deadline? He said no. And you can say that they're in win-now mentality. And it's not to mortgage the future, but it's to respect the present and what you're going at right now and how these players feel about what they have right now. I don't know if a 
a week and a week and a half long slump to me. The Buddy Heald's been going through shooting-wise. It means, well, hell, you know what? We got to throw up our hands and trade him before the trade deadline. We got to get something out of this. We got to get some draft capital. I just don't, to me, think you jeopardize, again, a guy that has consistently over his career been one of the best in doing what is at the highest value of the NBA offensively. Three-point shooting. You can take all your 15-footers and your bank shots and your points in the pain and working off the low block. And, man, look at that guy. He dunked, and that is all great. But eternally speaking now in the NBA, and we've been here for a long time, three is better than two. And especially with this Pacer defense, which, again, is not going to get drastically better, I just don't think you can afford to get rid of somebody who has been really good for your team offensively. One of the reasons why you're the best scoring team offensively or, you know, near the top, you know, still, I think, in the 124, somewhere in that neighborhood, shrinking. I think just a bit above 123.9 right now, but he has been a huge part of that. Yeah, I don't think you jeopardize it. You know, even if there are 15 different ways you can look at it and you're just so ingrained around here to think about draft capital and assets and all this bull crap that we've had to endure for the past three or four or so years or with the Colts basically forever, six years. <laughs> I think there are some things that make a lot of sense. And to me, making sure that you keep this team able to score Mix in some late-game defensive stops and then see what happens. This team is far from a finished product. I mean, even if you are going for it this year, it doesn't mean you're a finished product. It doesn't mean the vision is intact right here and right now. I mean, hell, they may have more of a greater vision further down the road. I just think, again, we're conditioned around here not to believe in both. It's always been one or the other. Hey, we're going to win right now or else. Or, hey, you know what? We're going to win further down the road or else. You know what? It's weird, right? Because seasons are different. You can have both. We just haven't been fortunate enough around here or smart enough around here at times to have both. And I'm selfish. I am a selfish son of a gun when it comes to that. Let's have both. What do they say? Have your cake and eat it too. Hey, speaking of which, Cluster Truck is coming in here a little bit later on. You guys heard of that? James, did you know that? Are you aware of it? I was not, no. Cluster truck is coming in here. I order a little mahi. Is it mahi-mahi, right? Yeah, the fish? The fish, oh, yeah. I love mahi-mahi. I'm a big seafood guy. Did you know that? Uh, yeah, I know. I've, I've walked in on you yeah. eating the uh, canned tuna that you eat. I'm the cat. Who wants to reference me in college as the cat at Ethan Crawford? Hey, don't walk in on the cat. The cat's dining here at lunch. Got a block of cheese, some crackers, and a can of Star Kissed. Cat's going to work. Now, nah, Cluster Truck's going to be in there at 4.30. Mahi, mahi, a little roasted potatoes. It's all going to be good. When I ordered that, they probably went. Because I think, like, I think Andy Sweeney, I think Sweebo, he and Bowen ordered, like, chips and queso and fries and tater tots. And then they go, wait a minute. This Newton guy's got roasted potatoes and jasmine rice. Who the hell are we delivering this to? Who just ordered that? Was it Ben Affleck sitting in today or is it JMV? Who the hell are we taking this food to? So, no, seriously, cluster truck coming up in the 4 o'clock hour. Greg Gregstraw is going to join us coming up at the bottom of the 3 o'clock hour, per usual in this three-hour window on a Tuesday. And my man is busy with a lot of stuff. I'm going to allow him. I've been apprehensive about embracing this because – I know that, that karma can get you. I believe in karma. I don't step on cracks in the sidewalk because that harms your mama. That hurts her back. All right? Listen, Devo told us that. So 
I'm mindful of cracks in the sidewalk. I don't walk under ladders. If a black cat crosses my path, I'm going to double back and go a different direction. I believe in all that stuff. I'm very superstitious. But I will allow Greg Gregstar to explain to me how he believes that Indiana State could get in without winning the Missouri Valley Conference Tournament because I just cannot. I was having a conversation with John Herrick, who does work with Don Fisher and Eric Sewer. He were later on tonight. That is going to be your counter to Peacock because IU and Ohio State's been Peacock tonight. So you got the IU Radio Network across the hall on 93 WIBC beginning at 6 o'clock tonight. But we were, you know, going over college basketball a little bit earlier and talking about Indiana State. And I said, John, I just can't sit here and tell you that I feel comfortable. I'll feel comfortable when there is no way in the world some committee gets together and gives me a good screwing. Seriously. We've all been hosed. When's the last time you were hosed, my friends out there, watching via the AAA Membership Lounge YouTube Live? When's the last time that you were hosed by a committee? Committees are formed to hose people. You didn't know that? Oh, the hosings happen with committees. Committees and boards, all that. They're there to hose us. I just want to see my team win their way in. And obviously it means you're playing your best at that moment. But win your way in. I will allow, however, Greg Rakestraw to give me thoroughly thought out information that pertains to the Sycamores and being able to secure an at-large bid. Uh, Greg's going to join us at the bottom of the hour. I mentioned IU Ohio State. Uh, Ohio State, if there's a guy like Mike Woodson's going nowhere, but let's just face it, the, the seat is hot. I, I don't know. Can you have a hot seat when you know he's not going anywhere? I think you can be on a hot seat when it appears the seat in which you're sitting in at that moment is so hot that it's never going to cool. Like, can you sit in a hot seat when you know you still got another year? And believe me, you still got another year. But it is clear that in a lot of cases right now that IU fans have completely crossed their arms, pouted a little bit, and have said there is no going back. You have proclaimed him not to be the guy. And it will take a lot of winning. A lot of situations that you just don't believe, not just this year, but even next year, this IU team would have within. And if there's anybody that has a hotter seat, it is Chris Holtman in Ohio State. Because it wasn't good last year, and in the last eight, it's been an absolute mess. And I would suggest IU going over there, the last thing you want to do after being housed at home by Penn State without their leading score is to go to Ohio State, who has been awful here in the last month or so, and get housed over there. And believe me, it is much easier to see this IU team getting shredded on the road. And what's interesting about it is you can make the argument their best game of the season so far, again, arguably, could have been that initial meeting against Ohio State in Bloomington. Now, we were all paying attention to stuff up here. You had the Colts and the Steelers on a Saturday night. You had Purdue and Arizona, Indiana State and Ball State. I mean, the Circle City was happening that night, but I believe in Bloomington, right? That was that Saturday night when everybody thought, hey, this is the IU team we want to see. This is the IU team that you can get with. Unfortunately, it has been very lonesome for that particular group that played that night at that level you just simply have not seen it it has been fleeting at best yeah you don't want to go over there and get worked this evening and i'm assuming that's what a lot of iu fans thoroughly expect to happen iu ohio states at seven o'clock again it's on the peacock they have been peacocked you all have been peacocked how many of you have just said you know what i don't know if this peacock's going to be worth it i'm done with it Anybody who said screw the peacock? <laughs> I so much want to go with the nickname, but I'm not because somebody will come running down the hallway shaking their fist. You can't do that. Anybody drop peacock? Especially IU fans. This would probably pertain more to IU fans than anybody. Who do you have tonight? 
Jack Collinsworth and Robbie Hummel. My man, Robbie Hummel. Robbie Hummel. Robbie Hummel may work more than Greg Rakestraw. Like Greg Rakestraw does everything. Greg Rakestraw, probably this weekend, will be covering the curling championships up in Ontario, Canada. Like Greg Rakestraw does it because he's great at doing everything. Now, I would suggest I work a lot, but I, I do this, yip, yap, and we have some drinks on a Thursday, and then I come back and play songs on a Saturday night for six hours. It's not like I'm working a jackhammer or anything like that. It's not like what you guys are doing out there. I respect that. Now, Robbie Hummel does, like, every Big Ten game imaginable. It's like they've cloned Robbie Hummel. All right, we're going to put the uh, – th- this is <laughs> this is the Tuesday night Peacock Hummel. And we got the Wednesday night Big Ten Network Hummel. And then we're going to have the Saturday Fox Hummel. I get cloned, Rob. It's like the uh, Eminem video. What's that Eminem song, the video? What is it? My name is Slim Shady, where they have a factory of Eminems. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that one. Uh, Hummel. Uh, JMV, why do you hate Peacock so much? It's not as bad as you think. I don't know. Does that mean I hate Peacock? I went out and bought it. I haven't dropped it yet. I don't know if there's any hate there. I'm just saying you've been Peacock tonight. Meaning, you know, you go from, uh, what was it, used to be Super Tuesday on ESPN? When you always knew where everything was. Remember there was a time when you always knew where every game is. Now it's like throwing a dart at a dartboard. You go, okay, where is this game tonight? All right, so it's a Tuesday night. It may be on Big Ten Network, but it might be on on the Peacock. Uh, Wednesday night, more than likely. Yeah, Wednesday night. So it's going to be on Big Ten Network. Thursday night, it may be on Big Ten Network. Friday is probably on Fox Sports 1. And then, frankly, I have no idea where it may be on Saturday. Oh, yeah, by the way, too, if you're on Sunday, it could be on CBS. A lot of enjoyment in that. Hey, the Butler Bulldogs, you're talking about making your mark last Friday in what was just a fantastic game to watch. There'd be nothing better to see Thad Mata's team flex against UConn later on tonight. Now, this is not what I would like to reference as a must win, but you talk about just locking it up. Lock yourself up a bid to the NCAA tournament. You go back-to-back Creatin, and then roll in, I don't know, are they in stores or are they in Hartford tonight? Wherever UConn's playing their games this evening. You roll in and beat the defending national champions. You got something going right there. Nah, it was impressive as hell. That Friday night game was fun, too. Yeah, I, I do. I like watching Greg McDermott coach teams. Not necessarily just that Creighton team, but really any Creighton team. It's fun. <laughs> so I can't wait. Now, that's later on tonight as well. We'll talk about that. So, we got a lot of hoops to talk about. Thank you, James. I will. Alice Golden setting the pace. Going to join us coming up in the 5 o'clock hour. We shall get you set for the Super Bowl and a little off-season chatter. He was MIA last week, but Spielberger is back. A little bit after 4 coming up on this Tuesday from pro football focus. Brad Spielberger will be here. The Cibasso says this, the most impressive part of Greg Rakestall is he can call six sports in two days and knows everything about each of the teams without looking at notes. It is incredible. And then he can call me on a Saturday night and request MC Hammer's turn this mother out back when everybody, like, thought MC Hammer was okay before he crossed over that bridge to having everybody in the hip-hop world making fun of him. Turn this mother out. Greg joins us coming up next. Alex Golden, Brad Spielberger, and we are waiting. It'd be later, right, for Trace? What's the deal on Trace? Uh, It would probably be around 530 if it does happen. I think it should happen, but it's still uncertain right now. James has got a good feel for Trace Jackson Davis. I don't think he got very much, if at any clock last night. I was watching Golden State in Brooklyn. Why is Kerr keeping him on the bench like that? He played some dude. What What was that guy's name that was playing last night? Had kind of the man bun working or the ponytail happen. 
We'll talk to Trace about his first year in Golden State. Golden State's probably headed for some significant changes here. Uh, we'll talk to Trace about that and being back in central Indiana on Thursday with the Warriors and the Pacers. All right, 239-1070. Email the address at jmv1075thefan.com inside the AAA Membership Lounge via YouTube Live. I'll say hello to everybody coming up in just a minute as well. The stream, the app, and HD radio on your chance to win – uh, Luke Bryan tickets. And by the way, RIP, you know me, I'm not probably the biggest of modern day country music fans. I'm more of a back in the day country music fan. I like the Johnny Cash, Merle Haggard, Johnny Lee, Statler Brothers, Oak Ridge Boys. But it, there is no doubt the significance that, that we, in, how should I put this? I'm trying to sound as, as good as I can with this. Um, I don't think how I should put it. Toby Keith. Toby Keith was was Americana and country. I like ingrained that. You know, one of the things with Toby Keith to me that I did really like is when he narrated something. I mean, his voice was like 60s quality narration. Love that. Uh, R.I.P. A Sky Point to... Toby Keith, who passed away of cancer, he'd been battling. Toby Keith was 62 years of age. I know a lot of country music fans out there certainly have uh, loved him and will continue to love him uh, in his passing. Uh, R.I.P. to Toby Keith. Quick break, we'll come back. Greg Gregster on the other side, 93.5107.5 The Fan. Quality care, remarkable.
Nomsmobile.com today. The Ride with JMV. Smokey, this is not Nom. This is bowling. There are rules. Hey. 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. Shout out to our promotions department right here. If you're watching via the AAA Membership Lounge YouTube Live, this is our NBA Jam T-shirts here. JMV Jam on the front. This is what you can get if you join me at Whiskey Business, Southport Road, Southside. That's NBA Jam, Michelob Ultra, your chance to be the high score. In advance of the finals, the JMV Jam. It has me and B Swift. B Swift right now is on uh, Hot 100.9. Uh, I am right here. But this is badass, and this is the T-shirt that you can get by joining us coming up on Thursday. Again, Whiskey Business. Southside. Southport Road cannot wait to see you there. The Andy Moore Automotive Group Hotline, Greg Rakestraw, joins us. So are you able to, given an effort, are you able to solidify a conversation to me that right now the Sycamores could get in as an at-large, would not necessarily have to win the Mo Valley Conference Tournament? Are you ready to say that? I think if they went out the regular season, John, I think they're in just because they do not have anything that constitutes a bad loss. You know, Alabama is not what they have been. Michigan State is not what they have been. Uh, But they're both certainly in the tournament conversation. Michigan State's case, they're the right side of the bubble at this point. Losing at Drake is not a bad loss. You know, I cited what their net ranking was last week. And, you know, Mike DeCourcy of of the various bracket experts, I'm going to be flipping through, I think he had them as like an eight or nine seed. Uh, right now, which tells me that you don't necessarily have to have that automatic qualifier. So uh, to use it in Jim Caldwell ease, they are trending in the right direction, John. So I had DeCourcy on yesterday and had to gripe at him because in his bracket forecast, he actually had Indiana State playing Florida Atlantic. So I had to get pissy about that. <laughs> you can't tug at John's heartstrings like that. <laughs> Come Although, on, man. The way you could look at it would be that guaranteed uh-huh. something that you're passionate about would advance the second round. That's yeah, the way to look at yeah it. he tried to pass that bull crap along to me yesterday, too, sorry. and I wasn't having it. Very so. political answer. My bad. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's all right. Um, So you think that they can, if they went out in the regular season, solidify their spot as that large. That's okay. Butler's on the road against UConn. Is this a – you upset UConn on the road tonight, then unless you absolutely lose out or fall flat, you're good to go for the tournament? I think you're heading in that direction. But, again, this is this is a found money game. Uh, you and I talked about this last week. If you could find a way to get one of Creighton – or UConn, you were going to be looking a whole lot better. Um, I, I, I study various bracketologists, John, this time of year. So I know that Joe Lunardi had them as first four out before um, before playing Creighton. And so that road win is, again, golden for Thad Mata's team. So, yes, tonight would be a quantum leap forward if you somehow beat the number one team in the country. But, again, because you're, beat, you're playing the number one team in the country – I don't think there's any sort of this is by no means a bad loss. There's no pressure on this game. You win it great. If not, you still got plenty of air and opportunity if you're Thad Modest Group. I was so impressed on Friday night with their win over Creighton on the road. I mean, that's one thing, but they had a lot of weird things happen down the stretch, trying to inbound the ball and things not going right and – um, obviously, uh, Davis, you know, getting his eye cut and having to go out. And then you had uh, Kapke come in having to knock down a couple of free throws. Some weirdness that normally gives the advantage to the home team of those situations that Butler ultimately overcame. They just never flinched. And we can talk about the, you know, mathematical impacts of the win in terms of the resume. But I think you cite a very important point. That's something you can tap into that reservoir for the rest of the year. When things aren't going your way, you know that in as, as hostile of environment as the Big East has, without having, you know, the fully stacked deck of cards for the Bulldogs, they found a way to get the job done. So I, I, I think that goes miles mathematically and mentally for that basketball team. So Greg Rakestraw, he's with us via the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. So IU embarrassed itself on Saturday at home against Penn State. Let's just face it, in the past month plus, Ohio State's been an absolute disaster, a mess. And while Mike Woodson's seat may be hot in the court of public opinion with IU fans, he's not going to go anywhere at the end of this year. 
Chris Holtman, on the other hand, yeah. he's backing up a season of dis- disappointment last year with yet another one. What may be in the cards in Columbus for their head coach? Uh, I would tend to agree that if they don't write the ship, they're probably going in a different direction. Uh, and, and that's nothing against Chris. I'm a big fan of Chris as both a person as a coach. But, again, uh, you have back-to-back rough years, and you see one kind of, you know, start to, to roll down the hill. You know, they've got the money at Ohio State to eat a contract and move on and find somebody else. And, again, because they've got so many seats to fill in that building, um, maybe there's a little more pressure on the basketball coach there than you normally think there would be in a place that is a football school. So uh, do I think either Indiana or Ohio State's going to be in the NCAA tournament? No. Does tonight have the feeling of an elimination game from the NCAA tournament? Yeah, it kind of does. But, yeah, I would agree. I think there's a little more pressure on Chris Holtman than, say, Mike Woodson going into it. Yeah, and, and I looked at it this way with Woodson. I think that there is a spot in which he's in right now that only a high level of winning next year that I think a lot of people are skeptical about getting from this IU basketball program. I think that's the only thing he can do to ever turn this fan base around because, to me, it is a large percentage that have just kind of gone away and thought, all right, this is what it is going to be right now and don't have too much hope. That's why I described it as a hot seat, even though it's a hot seat without him going anywhere at the end of the year. The worst thing that you can have is apathy. Um, and, and we've talked about that at various times over the years. If, if, people stop, if people stop calling and complaining, that's a bad sign. Um, and you've got obviously what Purdue has done from a regular season standpoint the last three years. You have a revitalized Pacers organization. You have the Colts that had a, while, while a, a, a difficult finish, a better year than expected. Um, you're going to start to lose your grip a little bit in terms of the local sports scene. That is a big-time problem. Um, that would be my major concern now if I'm, if I'm Scott Dolson and company. He's uh, Greg Rakestraw, I'm sure, has a busy week and weekend we'll get into in a second. But your impression on the Boilers, I know in a lot of ways they're doing what we expect them to do. But that also doesn't mean it's without an impression that you set. And I thought Sunday in Madison was one of those impressions that maybe you don't value enough because that's the level of expectation. But they went the way they went about it was very professional, I felt, on Sunday. Yep. That's a good way to describe it. And I, and I think there's two or three things that have some carryover from that win. One, you won't find a, a, a tougher place to win this year – than winning at Madison. In other words, combination of atmosphere and team, that, that's the best you're going to face in terms of road games this year. Secondarily, you saw the progression of Braden Smith, even if there were a couple of miscues at the end of the game. You saw the kind of the plays they ran, the shots that he hit, um, kind of the, the, just the general basketball IQ that has improved from his freshman year to his sophomore year. They were able to win a, a big-time road game with Zach Eady not having a dominant performance. And, and that's how ridiculously high the bar is set for him. He had you know, 18 and 13. He was 7 of 13 from the field. And we go, man, he didn't play all that well. That's how, again, stupid good he's been the last couple of years. And I said this in talking to Jake Query earlier today, that, you know, there's, there's just a touch of Jaden Ivey and Lance Jones' game. He's not asked through the same things. But there's a couple of plays every game that he makes where he's just kind of like, screw it, I got this, I'm going to take care of this, and he did. Think about that late three against Arizona. Think about the layup and a a second-half three he made in this game. You add all those things up, and again, all of the factors are there pointing in the right direction for Purdue. It's just a matter, can you get the job done by the time we get to March 22nd? Because kind of get the feeling that's where Purdue's going to start their postseason path will be at Gamebridge Fieldhouse on Friday, March 22nd. I just think about it like this, too. If anybody wants to make the comparison to their first-round loss in Columbus last year, and you saw, and I know that you have another year on their backcourt with with Lawyer and and Smith, but you saw a lot of dudes in that late-game situation looking like they didn't want a part of that late-game situation. Lance Jones is somebody that does not look like whatever – the situation is that he would not attack it just like we've seen so far. And I think that's what kind of what makes the way the season ended in 22, all the more disappointing is that, you know, you had that guy that could take over late in terms of Jaden Ivy 
maybe Zach Eady's not the player that, you know, then that he is now, but that's why you felt you had that because he had that knack for hitting all of those late shots throughout the course of that regular season leading up to the postseason and it's kind of went away on one night against a 15th seed. So, Greg, Greg Straw with us. So, what do you got later on this week? You doing any of the uh, girls' regionals? How, what They go regional, semi-state. I, I kind of forget the, the path now is, is what they that have. Is, that is the path. The only thing that changed is that we are back to what it was the first couple of years of, of, of the multi-class format. One game regional, two games at one site, and then you play a four-game semi-state. So, um, I'll okay. have on the boys' side Friday night, Ben Davis and Lawrence North. On the girls' side, I'll do both games at Decatur Central. Uh, the, the second one, the Pike Plainfield game, will go to my Indy TV. So TV for me both Friday night and Saturday night this weekend. Part of the big story um, really on Saturday night was a good amount of upsets across the state. So whether it was North Knox, who after beating South Knox, got beat by Linton Stock down in 2A, those are the top two teams in the state, and both of them, neither one of them made the regional round. You had other upsets like that in, in various different sectionals. I mean, not necessarily a top-ranked team because Lawrence Central won their first sectional in 37 years. They're number one in 4A. My beloved Eagles did not get upset. They are number one in 1A and still playing. They go back to West Northern. They got to Crawford County for the regional this weekend. So we are at the regional round of the tournament, and 32 teams will advance to the semi-state the following Saturday at eight different sites across the state of Indiana. So I, I'm taking Laney down to Bedford because uh, CG yep. and uh, Jeff Allen's Bedford North Lawrence stars, the defending champions match up in that regional. And the thing is, is that, you know, Bedford shouldn't view it that way, but you could view Bedford as the defending champs beating Jennings County as an upset. Yeah. Jennings County thumped Bedford North Lawrence on January the 3rd, which ended a 25 game losing streak that J.C. had had to BNL, and BNL came back and got him in the sectional championship by four days. Yeah, it's funny. I You mentioned North Knox in closing here. There was a time, I can't remember how long ago it was. Remember Tom Gugliotta in the NBA? Absolutely, and he, and he had family from Bicknell, correct? He did. Tom Gugliotta had family in Bicknell, so I believe some Gugliottas played – High school basketball at North Knox. That was always kind of a, a weird – you saw that name, which you, you never had seen other than, you know, what, North Carolina State in college and then in the NBA with the Washington Wizards, then the Washington Bullets, whatever, and then all of a sudden you see that name pop up again in Bicknell, Indiana. It was interesting. I'm not sure, though, if his cousin had the matching barbed wire tattoo that Tom had that was circa <laughs> 1996 in his T-Wolves days. Did he, uh, was he a part of the NC State team when they tried out those, like, uni, uh, what are they, the, the uniform, they just the whole uniform was just like one piece. Like the old, like the old spandex uniform? Yes, it was, like a, it was just like a one-piece uniform. It was awful. I, I thankfully, John, can say I, I vividly don't remember that. It's probably good for everybody involved. I just remember Fire and Ice in the backcourt wore that uniform once. Remember who Fire and Ice was? No, help me. Chris was, Corciani. Was Corciani, was Corciani a, a part of that? Okay, who was the other one? Then? Rodney Monroe, I believe, was the ice oh. part of Fire and Ice. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Learn a little something every day on this show, don't you? Yes, which is why I call in every Tuesday so I can be schooled in the ways of the fire and ice from JMB. And let's also make sure we make a note of the fact you called in Saturday night and requested MC Hammer before he was ostracized by basically everybody, including the music community and especially the hip-hop community. Before that, there was Turn This Mother Out. He was MC Hammer and got a lot of respect then. And then Can't Touch This made him a lot of money but got him a lot of haters, was uh, mutually respected by the hip-hop community. John, you got to remember, and this is switching genres, but at the end of Behind the Music, Metallica, Lars Ulrich, when asked if he sold out, he says, yes, we do, every night. And that line probably applied to MC Hammer about a three- or four-year stretch of time as well. 1988, he, uh, 88, 89, he, he turned the mother out, though, and got some respect. Which is why you turned it out on Saturday night for me on B1057, <laughs> and for that I'm grateful. Indeed I did. I appreciate you, man. We'll do it again next week. All right, now the big story is going to be, are we celebrating Valentine's Day this Saturday on the show, or is it the following Saturday on nah, the show? I'll probably push it in a little bit this weekend. 
So, yeah, we'll do – I mean, there'll be a lot of – like Mike Wells will love to listen to it. I'm sure there'll be a lot of hip-hop slow jams. So, yeah. So it is a slide it in right to the top Saturday night. With <laughs> exactly. Takeover on B105. It, it'll, be a, it'll be a night of heen and sheen. So, yes. I, I, I got my playlist ready for it. I'll be talking to you soon. You got it, buddy. Thanks, Greg. See ya. So, Greg Rakestraw on the Andy Moore Automotive Group Hotline. Spielberger, top of the hour. Alex Golden coming up. Hopefully, Trace Jackson Davis as well before the end of the show. AAA Membership Lounge via YouTube Live at 93.5 and 107.5 The Fan. In order for small businesses to thrive, they need to be smart, efficient, savvy, staying ahead of the market at
Just got your asses whipped by a bunch of damn nerds. 93.5 and 107.5, The Fan. James over there, I'm John. Greg Rakeshaw, podcast 107.5thefan.com. AAA Membership Lounge via YouTube Live. Hello, everybody. Litzy writes this, so once Buddy Heald starts hitting at his normal rate, Pacers will be easily back over 125. I I just know that defense is is going to get better with a lot of teams. It is, it's gotten better with the Pacers, but it's not going to get significantly better. And I have mentioned this a number of times. I would be scared to take away any of the legitimate offensive threats. And even going through a struggle point where he is right now, that's what he is. And I just think a lot of people around here, you know, I talk about sports arousals and, you know, what gets you excited as a sports fan. I think so many people around here are conditioned to want to talk about trades and, you know, well, this is what we can look at down the road. And I also realized that some of that down the road, that future thinking, was the reason why they were able to execute the Pascal Siakam trade. But there is a point where I get sick and stinking tired of hearing about it. Buddy Heald, over his career, has been one of the better three-point shooters ever. Sometimes you go through a funk a struggle, and it's frustrating. I just don't know if – I value his offense and believe it's going to be there. Sure, he can't guard a chair, but there are a lot of dudes on this team that can't guard a chair. Yeah, I would – I'd be a little hesitant to so easily, well, we got to trade and trade him for picks or trade him for future draft assets or draft capital. You guys can have that. I would suggest, and again, I'm not worried about you know, the expiring contracts or anything like that. The reason why is because Chad Buchanan was on last Monday, and he wasn't worried about it. And he's the Pacers' general manager. I do want to see this group. I want to see what they can do together and really together for the first time. Come back with that. Spielberg is going to be here at PFF top of the hour, a little Super Bowl conversation, some off-season conversation too. Alice Golden here in the 5 o'clock hour, and hopefully Trace Jackson Davis of Golden State, the former Hoosier, former Mr. Basketball, former Center Grove Trojan, all that, and Luke Bryan tickets as well. 93.5107, by the fan. Finding great candidates to hire.
The Ride with JMV. Son, you got a panty on your head. You drive fast, eh? 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. Fred Smith at the Boilers tomorrow. Now the uh, bull part of Sweebo tomorrow, too. Whiskey Business with NBA Jam and Mick Ultra coming up on Thursday. Um, it was good news today. I mentioned this. We'll get back into it in a bit. Jake and I were talking about it during a crossover. Is that Jim Ursay sent out a tweet, posted a message on X for the first time in really nearly a month. And uh, the quote was, on the mend, grateful for all the messages of love and support. If you remember the Colts back on the 9th of January released a statement saying Jim Ursay was undergoing treatment for a severe respiratory illness, hospitalized. It's unclear whether or not he's been released, but all of this came on the heels of Ursay being found unresponsive in his home back on the morning of December the 8th. Again, this report, courtesy of our friend Stephen Holder of ESPN, ESPN.com. But it was good to hear anything positive because we had heard nothing again for the better part of a month. Get back to that coming up in just a second. Rockets Pacers Fieldhouse tonight. Are you on the road at Ohio State? That's Peacock at 7 tonight, 6 p.m. Your coverage begins across the hall on 93 WIBC. Butler's on the road at UConn tonight. I believe that is a Fox Sports 1 broadcast for you later on this evening. On the Andy Moore Automotive Group Hotline, Pro Football Focus took a bit of a hiatus last week. Back in the fold this week. The, our Spielberger guy is back with us on the Andy Moore Automotive Group Hotline. It's almost like we missed a month when we miss a week with you. Uh, I appreciate that. I, uh, I'm here in Vegas, so I'll apologize in advance. I tried to find the quietest place I could, but it, it is Las Vegas. So, where where so are you? Where are you the, right now? Yeah, I'm at the Mandalay Bay Hotel, which is where the big convention center, where everything's going down media-wise, players coming through. Um, that, that's the hub of, of the whole operation this week. Have you interviewed anybody else besides doing this interview with us? Oh, yeah. We've been busy. I was on with Ed McCaffrey this morning, actually, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, he does a lot of work with Sirius XM, but it's also fun when his son is playing in the big game in a couple of days. Yeah, no doubt about that. It's a good find right there for you. So a lot of people have suggested maybe – this whole Vegas thing, because it is Vegas, would not be working smoothly. But I would assume because it's Vegas, it would work smoothly. What do you gather yeah, so know, far? Yeah, sorry, good job. Yeah, they know how to handle the big crowds and, and and stuff like that. I've been here for some NBA events, some of league stuff like that as well. So you have these massive convention centers, and it's, it's actually very well organized. I'll give the league credit. Like great security, great great organization, all these signs everywhere. To you know, you're maneuvering through casinos at seven in the morning Pacific. Uh, you know, smelling cigarette smoke as you're trying to go do your, your job. That part's interesting, but no, they're, they're doing a very good job. <laughs> <laughs> you see, it's weird. There was a point in time when I was growing up where you didn't even notice cigarette smoke. And now if you're within two miles of somebody smoking a cigarette, you know. You're done right. You're done right. I, I'm ready to transition where I remember as a kid when you, you no longer could smoke inside. That was when I was, I don't know, maybe early high school days. But yeah, Vegas. Uh, is a lawless society, so that has not applied here yet. <laughs> when I, seriously, when I was in high school, they, and this was in the 80s, they would allow you to take a permission slip home for your parents to sign to give you permission to smoke cigarettes at school in this one particular place. And what was so ironic, ridiculous, I don't know how you really want to describe it, was you you were able to smoke in front of the lone Coke machine in the school that they would not turn on until 3 o'clock because they didn't want kids all sugared up. But you were allowed to smoke yeah. cigarettes with a permission slip from your parents right in front of that Coke machine. That is, I thought you were going to say it was more of an angle of they wanted you to buy all the Coke products out of the machine. So you're thirsty, you had a cigarette, now you need a Coke. But, yeah, that is, that is quite ironic and, and sounds like the 70s and 80s that I always hear about. Oh, it was a blast. Brad Spielberger, Pro Football Focus, is with us. Most interesting aspect as we walk up to the Super Bowl coming up on Sunday, storylines, both sides, what interests you the most so far? 
Yeah, I think at a high level, start with the quarterbacks. So I think two fascinating matchups. You have Nick Bosa, who's going against Juwan Taylor. I set an NFL record this year for penalties taken. Nick Bosa has the second highest quick pressure rate, under two and a half seconds, getting to the quarterback over the last three seasons, trails only Micah Parsons. And on the flip side, Patrick Mahomes has the lowest pressure to sack rate. About 10% of the time when he gets pressured, does he get sacked? It's, 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 It's a phenomenal number for him. So that matchup, and then on the flip side, Brock Purdy this year quietly led the NFL in touchdown passes, yards per attempt, and total passing yards against the Blitz. And Steve Spagnuolo in Kansas City ran the eighth highest Blitz rate in the NFL. They lose Charles Amenahu. They're a pretty good edge rusher in, in the game last week. Are they going to Blitz more? And are the Niners and Brock Purdy going to have the answer like they did all year long? So Brad Spielberger, a pro football focus, staked out in Vegas for the Super Bowl coming up on Sunday. He's on the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. So, is Brock Purdy as bad as some would suggest or as good? Certainly it's a great story, but as good as others might profess. Where is he right now in terms of his level of play for the Niners? He might be the most perfect litmus test of how we are incapable of having nuance in NFL discussions. And you're either a first ballot <laughs> Hall of Famer or you stink. And there's no in between. There's no you know middle ground for me. I think he is between the 11th and 15th best quarterback. I think people that say he's a game manager and, you know, just driving the bus, but he's not part of it are wrong. I think people that say he's a top 10 quarterback are also wrong. I think he is a clear starter, top 12, top 15 type of guy. Um, And the difference is he's going to draw from Jimmy Garoppolo is he is a better athlete. He can move around the pocket or scramble. You saw last week against Detroit, 48 rushing yards on those scrambles which were huge in a lot of those scenarios, picking up first downs on on second long, third long. And then secondly, he will try to make throws, which of course goes both ways, but Jimmy Garoppolo never, you know, tried to make a a dangerous throw per se. And you want some of that. You need some of that at times. Purdy will try to throw into tight windows, throw into some double, triple coverage, which again, not all the time good, but he will take those risks. And it's led to, you know, look at the Brandon IU catch last week for 50 yards bouncing off the DB's helmet, you know, that, that's obviously a lucky, you know, example, but, but that's the thing for me. He, he's not a key manager in his style um, just because he's a limited, you know, thrower arm talent wise. So does he make this Niners team, the Super Bowl contender, the participant that it is, or do others around him with his level of play combined make this team that way? Because it really is a different viewpoint with the Niners than it is basically every other successful team out there. Yeah, it's more the guys around him. But, but again, I think it comes back to, like, you can't be – in today's day and age in the NFL, I don't think you can be a quarterback that's outside the top 15, maybe 20. Um, and you could have, you know, all pros at every other position. And I think eventually it's just going to rear its ugly head. You'll play a good offense in a playoff game, and you just won't be able to stay in. So, he is good. But I do think at the same time, you have not only the playmakers. First, Kyle Shanahan, one of, if not the best play callers in all of football, uh, maybe ever. Uh, I know he, people. some people want him to get a ring first to say that, but he's been in you know four NFC Championship games and two Super Bowls for a reason. But but secondly, you have two probably top 20 wide receivers. People do not talk enough about Brandon Ayuk, how good he is. Everyone knows about Debo Samuel. You have maybe the best back in football the last five, six years in Christian McCaffrey. And you have the best dual threat tight end blocker and receiver in George Kittle. So, yeah, no, it's a loaded team. Oh, and how I forget, Trent Williams – you know, probably a first ballot Hall of Fame left tackle. So yeah, the team is phenomenal. They're, they're so, so talented. But Purdy is not dragging them down. He, he is elevating them at times. So Brad Spielberger, a pro football folk, is live in Vegas on the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. So let's just say the Chiefs run rough shot and win the Super Bowl again. Is there any thought that Andy Reid steps away or does he continue moving forward down that path of incredible levels of success as a coach in Kansas City? It's interesting. The only that I've seen, you know, kind of voice you're hearing talking about that is Mike Florio, pro football talk. And look, he he is at times a bit of a conspiracy theorist. He also does, though, you know, get out of the head of some stories. And then we look back and say, yeah, you know, Mike was, was on to something there. So I haven't seen anyone else talk about it but him. Look, he's up there in age. I'll say I saw him in person yesterday. He's lost some weight, looks pretty healthy, uh, which maybe is a factor in his decision. I just feel like if you're still enjoying it and, and feel good about it, and you have this team of Patrick Mahomes, I don't see why he would step away. So, look, I don't think he's going to be here forever, but, but I think he'll be back next year. If the Chiefs win this thing, where do they rank after a win all time 
organization team wise? Where would you put them? I think it's the second best dynasty in the history of the sport, you know, after the, the New England Patriots. And this is, you know, people will probably be turned off by this if they're a bit older, but I just think it's become so much harder to sustain winning in the NFL. So, of course, I'm a student of the game. I remember the Steelers teams, the Raiders teams, the Niners teams. This is not a knock on those organizations, but just what it takes now to sustain winning. And I think we are a bit kind of, you know, deluded by the Patriots run and how good they were for so long, but. You see these teams that make these runs. They make one or two Super Bowls. They win one or two, and that's all they have. Like Seattle was a dominant force. They they got one ring out of it. So you know, I, I think they really are behind the Patriots. Probably the you know oh one oh three oh four, and maybe you know kind of what twenty was it six seven eight? They made three in a row. I think they're, they're right in that conversation. Mahomes will have been to five Super Bowls. He'll have three rings. He'll have made six AFC Championship games every single season of his career. It, hard to hard to compete with that. It's funny because we mentioned during the the Brady Patriots dynasty that we would never see that again, and you know, lo and behold, I mean, we're the table set with Mahomes, and you mentioned Andy Reid hanging around, and that particular team, the table is set to see that again. So it is, but the fascinating thing for me is, can they retool? Right? I mean, I I was actually we were watching some some O one highlights and that roster compared to even the 07 team the 2011 team that obviously did not win but made it Super Bowls of course the undefeated regular season team um that was a whole different roster so what's going to be fascinating is look Travis Kelsey 33 34 years old that's ancient for a tight end he, he does not have many years left in this league can they find new playmakers can they keep the offensive line intact with you know the center Creed Humphrey could be one of the highest paid players soon their guards are good player like That'll be the next test is this this second phase where they need new playmakers, new pass protectors. That's going to be fascinating. If they can, then yeah, they're they're, they're the Patriots again, but, but that's the real test. What impresses you the most about the 49ers, their offense or their defense? Their offense, their defense quietly has not been good for about two months now. I I think it should be more of a storyline. You've been able to run on them uh, off edge. You can run at chase young. He's showed some lackluster effort at times. Um, and on the interior, they signed Javon Hargrave to that massive free agent contract. Still a good interior pass rusher, but he's a guy you can run on as well. Um, and the secondary, they don't really prioritize it. So, Traveria Ford, a good player in a revenge game against his former Kansas City Chiefs. But it's a good secondary. It's not a great secondary, really, at any position. Um, to me, it's the offense, where they can now win in a different, different style. They can go kind of high pass rate. They, of course, can bleed clock and run down your throat for you know, these 10-play, 80-yard drives that take up eight minutes of game time. It's just the different ways in which they win. Kyle Shanahan is always changing and adapting. You see a ton of in- outside zone, under center. You see more shotgun. Like He's just always adding wrinkles to his offense. Who is their most valuable offensive player in terms of winning games? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think it's hard to argue with Debo Samuel. Um, you know, Kittle's probably a, a safe answer as well just because of what he brings in both facets. But what Debo Samuel enables them to do is, is the interchangeability with him and Christian McCaffrey, where when they're out there together, they can both be in the backfield, they can both be in the slot, they can both be out wide, you can motion those guys. You can just do so much when they're both out there that defenses really have no idea what they're looking at. And you saw when he missed time this year was when they had their three-game skid, um, you know, the middle of the season. He just – it's the guy you have to account for on every single snap because if you don't, he's going to break off a 70-yard touchdown, force some missed tackles. He was phenomenal against Detroit. I think he's the guy just like, – he has a gravity to him where when he's out there, it elevates every other player in that offense. So Brad Spielberger, Pro Football Focus, with us via the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. So what's your call coming up on Sunday in Vegas? I think the main thing for me is we're going to see points, points, points. I think this is going to be a high-scoring affair. I I love the Chiefs defense, I do, but you can also run on them a bit, and I think you are going to see them struggle a bit to defend that run. Um, And then you can attack them over the middle of the field a little bit. We saw Nick Bolton was in coverage on Zay Flowers a bunch last week, and it did not go particularly well. So I just mentioned Debo Samuel and Christian McCaffrey. I think they're going to have a pretty high target share. And the flip side, the Niners defense is still a good unit. Don't get me wrong, but you can score on them. But look at their numbers the last two months, and they have they have not been that good on that side of the ball. So, final score, I'm going to go 31-24 Kansas City uh, with, a, with a late touchdown. But I think the main thing is they're going to move the ball in this game. Hey, Brad, we're constantly looking for, at least around here, a diva elite-level wide receiver that has be- become disgruntled in their present position and wants to do something to get out. Is there anybody in, that is nearing or in that territory right now that we can talk about around here? 
So I, I won't say diva or anything like that, but I do think just because we're talking Super Bowl, Brandon Ayuk's situation is fascinating. I, I think he's one of the more underrated players in the league, and I know he's a known player, but I think he's like really a top 20, top 15 receiver. What's interesting with him is they've already paid Debo. They're paying Christian McCaffrey. They're paying Trent Williams, George Kittle, you know, Fred Warner on defense, Nick Bosa, yada, yada, yada. Can they now step up again and pay him, I don't know, 24, $25 million a year on top of all of their big contracts? Maybe if they feel they can't, they're willing to trade him for a massive, massive haul, try to get younger, get cheaper. So I don't think he's going to push his way out. I, I doubt he wants to push his way out. But that one, it might be a pipe dream, but, but that is a fascinating situation for me to watch. And, and he would be a great element to, to bring to Indianapolis. Wins in different ways. One of the best route runners in the NFL. Good after the catch of the ball in his hands. Um, good ball tracker. Good footwork. He had the sideline. He, he would really elevate that offense. 75 catches, I believe. I, he went, uh, what did he go, well over like uh, 1,300 yards, I think, right, this past season too? Did he not? Yeah. 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 And receiving? There was a yeah, there was a stretch through week eight where he had – I think he only had one catch that wasn't a first down through the first, like, two months of the season. <laughs> Man, that gets us all excited. See, because yesterday I was talking to Stephen Holder of ESPN, ESPN.com, and he had a story regarding Stephon Diggs. Um, I don't know if that went anywhere or not. I don't even know – Like to me, when you look at a guy like Stephon Diggs, we'll look at him, like, just in general right here. Is he a guy that his, – is his value at all um, undermined by – what has transpired personality wise with him in Buffalo the past couple of years? Yeah, maybe a little bit, you know, whenever you're complaining about playing with, I don't know, probably the second best quarterback in the NFL, whether you're complaining or not, or just putting out cryptic <laughs> messages or your brother is tweeting out like free this man. And again, he doesn't control his brother, but you know, whenever that stuff's happening and it's like, how much better can it get than playing with Josh Allen? Maybe Patrick Mahomes, that's probably it. So, Maybe. The thing with him is the financial situation is a disaster for uh, Buffalo if they have to move on. Like, it's almost untenable given their cap situation. So, I don't know how they would navigate it. They have a massive, massive dead cap hit. He's going to be 30 years old, I want to say, next year. And he also kind of fell off a cliff the last two months of the season. They kind of phased him out of the offense a little bit. They ran the ball a lot more. But, but he wasn't even all that impressive the last couple months. Hey, what's going to happen with offensive guru Eric Bieniemy? Uh, it's a good question. I, there really is not a lot of conversation about it. I, I imagine he becomes a you know, senior offensive advisor or something like that, maybe a run game coordinator, an RB's coach, with a, you know, somebody he's connected to, maybe go back to Kansas City. I don't know. But I, I think the, you know, why is Eric Bannemi not a head coach storyline, I, I think is, is no longer really something we're going to hear a lot about. I just, I, I'm curious, is, is this just simply put a, a product of the environment that certainly hasn't worked out for him when he's, been given an individual responsibility, I guess, with a different team playing in in Washington. I mean, you make an argument. They're not even in the, the neighborhood, the zip code, of having the weapons and the offense that they have in Kansas City. How would you describe him as an offensive coach right now? Yeah, so it's interesting. He has the run game and, and running backs a uh, foundation, but also at the highest pass rate in the NFL this past year in Washington. I think he does have good route concepts, can, can get guys open, um, can manufacture touches for – Guys lower on the depth chart, so he doesn't just rely on the top weapons and spread the ball around. Apparently the thing with him, to kind of bring our conversation full circle here, he is viewed as this like very hard-nosed, tough, old-school coach. You had commanders players kind of saying he was kind of like holding everyone accountable and, and really not pissing them off, but kind of like rubbing them the wrong way. You hear it in Kansas City, they kind of now said this year, they kind of missed that element of really being a hard-nosed, tough guy. I think some teams might think, you know what, it, it, with Gen Z athletes coming up in the NFL, that style just might not really work anymore, which isn't his fault. Um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, it's what they were all looking for. But the Mike McDaniel, I mean, he's unique. But, but kind of the more forward-thinking, progressive, positive reinforcement, not negative reinforcement, like I think that's where the league is going. It's Brad Spielberger of Pro Football Focus. Before I let you go, I want to get to the Eagles opening up in Sao Paulo. Uh, coming up, um, uh, yeah, but what, September of 2024, uh, that's where they're going to open up in Brazil. I don't know who they're going to play. Maybe you do. We'll talk about that. But Nick Sirianni, obviously here as an offensive coordinator once upon a time, was that kind of an ultimatum, organizationally speaking, that you you got to punt these coordinators uh, to make this right because you're next? What's going on in Philly there? Yeah, I think to a degree it was, because it's actually interesting. We had the same scenario. When Doug Peterson got fired, there was the same story that came out where Doug is going to submit a list of potential coordinator hires, 
And what happened with him was, I guess he did that. We didn't hear who was on the list or what the ideas were. But then a week later, two weeks later, he just got fired. So maybe his list wasn't as good as, uh, you know, Vic Fangio and, and Kellen Moore. So Sirianni said, hey, I still have really talented, qualified people that want to work for me, work with me. So then he you know, kept his job for, for next year at least. Um, but I think they will have a long runway. Uh, you know, the guy made a Super Bowl, won, started off 10-1 and one this year. Yes, it finished very ugly, um, but I think they'll give him some time to kind of right the ship, uh, transition to a new phase. A lot of veteran players may be on the way out. Um, and I'll, I have no idea who they're playing in Sao Paulo. I didn't even know that was happening until you just told me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I didn't know it was. I, it, it surprises me that they open up there. But uh, I don't think they've had an international game since 2018, from what they said. I, I'm just kind of curious if that was going to be an NFC East game or it'll be something a little bit different right there. That's, that's to me, that's difficult. To start out the season doing that. That's all, it. Almost seems a little bit deflating to me. It's interesting too because I think the elevation there is going to be very, very different than any. You know, mile high it probably is even close to what that could be in Sao Paulo. Uh, yeah, it's probably is tough. Like at the same time, maybe you say, you know, it's week one. You go maybe go two weeks early and kind of, you know, get adjusted, yeah. get ready for it. But, yeah, week, week two is going to be interesting. <laughs> All right, it's Brad Spielberger, Pro Football Focus in Vegas. What are you writing about, who you're going to talk to? Because clearly you're a hell of a lot cooler than any of us around here right now. <laughs> I don't know about all that. But uh, so I, I just put out yesterday the, the landing spots for free agent running backs and tight ends. Uh, and then tomorrow should be – the pending free agent offensive linemen and some fits for them schematically, stuff like that. So we'll flip over to the defensive side of the ball next week. Uh, we'll keep adding names to our free agent list. Uh, so all, all things off season for me. All right. So next Tuesday we're going, we'll do recap of the Super Bowl. We'll start getting all in on free agency around here, right? Sounds great to me. All right, Brad, man, have a great week and weekend in Vegas. Enjoy the Super Bowl. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Brad Spielberger, Pro Football Focus, every Tuesday in the 4 o'clock hour right here. Uh, Alice Golden and we're thinking Trace Jackson Davis coming up in the uh, 5 o'clock hour. But in here right now, go ahead and get his uh, mic if you would not mind over there, James. Uh, Evan Sherrill? Evan Sherrill. Cluster Truck, right? Cluster Truck. I know that you brought in food to the Sweebo Morning Show a little bit earlier. The morning wake-up call with KB and Andy. Thank you so much for bringing in the food for me today. What, what do we to. got over there? Uh, I got your black and mahi sandwich. Oh, yeah, baby. Pulled off the grill right before I came I over. Uh, I got a cheesy bread for James. Butter made in-house. James got something. Garlic and basil butter food. made in-house by our chefs. Nice. Uh, Chipotle ranch with that is my go-to. Also made in-house. That's Very much delicious. appreciated, man. Thank you Look so much. Yeah, of course, man. of course. Got our. I told uh, him early he's, he was SOL. <laughs> <laughs> never, never. I brought I brought Mark Dyke and a lazy burrito earlier too, but Corbin was in. Oh, for Corbin him, so was he in. Got to eat yeah, when Dyke's yeah. I think in Orlando or doing <laughs> something right now. But yeah, hey, how, how can people get a hold of you? Because I cannot wait to dive in to that bag over there. So how can people get a hold of you? Absolutely, clustertruck.com. We offer free delivery all over the city, all the way from Fountain Square up through Carmel. Uh, Download our app, and we also offer pickup as well if you live outside. I, I was telling Andy earlier, he lives in Irvington like myself and nope. just outside the zone, so we offer pickup for people like that as well. What about Bargersville? Will you come down to my place? <laughs> working on it. We're working on <laughs> now, it. Now, how did Cluster Truck get its start? Yeah, so started in, uh, I believe, 2016 mm -hmm. by Chris Baggett. Um, basically, you know, <clears throat> he always talks about there was this talk of, uh, how do we make the food last longer in the box for yeah. delivery? But really what he saw was, you know, we need to make the, the delivery time shorter or quicker or the food to sit out less. So we don't cook our food until the driver is on the way to the kitchen, um, unlike, you know, third parties where right. they don't know where the driver is. They cook the food, it sits out for an hour or two, and then it gets to your house. So uh, our food is cooked and delivered within 10 minutes of the kitchen, um, and that's why our zones are kind of tight, but – it ensures a quality uh, product. Well, uh, the the most quality you're going to find is that of, of Cluster Truck in a business that, if you were telling me this 15, 20 years ago, that you know the food delivery game was going to be at this level. But, man, Cluster Truck, shout out to you guys for doing what you do because it is a world where everybody's coming at you right now and you guys reign supreme. That's pretty awesome. Well, we appreciate that. And shout out to you guys. Uh, Cannot lie, this is the greatest moment of my week right now. Is it across really? From you, did, they so. let you, did they let you on today in the morning? 
no, 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 no. But I, you know, Some just just meeting Kevin and Andy is great. Yeah, just yip yapping <laughs> back and forth to one another about draft capital and trade assets and all that nerdery. So I got to have you on. You're bringing the food. You're an important piece of the mechanism working right here. The food. So mahi mahi. I, I now, did you get? Do you think my order was weird? Because I'm a seafood guy, and I didn't go for tater tots or anything like that. I went different. You went different. I did not peg you for a seafood guy, and, and your order, you didn't put it in until a little late, so I was I nervous. I was going to go, like, you know, pizza, <laughs> chicken strips for you, but I like what you got. It's different, and, you know, we have so many different options on the menu. It, you know, it, it makes sense to go for different options sometimes and, and try that variety out. You didn't picture me as a roasted potatoes, jasmine rice type of guy right here, did you? I'm guessing. I did not. That that made more sense to me than the mahi, though. The, you I know, love it. Potatoes I'm and sorry, rice. I'm sorry. I love it. And, <laughs> and let me tell you, it, it is a tough seafood game around here. And to bring seafood like that on the road, that's impressive right there. It's tough. Be on the lookout for a new piece of fish coming for Lent as well. We, oh, we, my yeah, goodness. We so, might have something new on the menu well, here soon. Anytime, so. anytime you got uh Anytime you got any seafood, bring it, man. I'm a big fan. Heard. You know we'll feed you anytime. Absolutely. Evan Sherrill of Cluster Truck, first timer on the show. Man, we'd love to have you back. Come back in. Will do. Hey, Absolutely. Plus, they can get a hold of you guys how? One more time. Clustertruck.com. Download our app. Free delivery. We also offer pickup. That is Evan Sherrill stepping up in a big way right here. Well done. Thank you very much. Evan Sherrill of Cluster Truck, and I'm going to dig into that coming up in a minute. Thank you for remembering James over there, too. Always, always. Love that. Uh, Alex Golden, top of the hour. I think Trace Jackson Davis, hopefully. Any word as of solidifying that? I have not heard since the last time I heard from them, but I'm still optimistic. I'm still optimistic. Luke Bryan tickets, too. I haven't got time for it on the other side of 239-1070, if you so desire. A lot of things going on. Rockets, Pacers tonight. Hoosiers on the road at Ohio State. Butler on the road at UConn. Got you covered with ample amounts of hoop at 239-1070. Next. Back in my day, we would...
Describe the sound made when a sheep explodes. <laughs> 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. Brad Spielberger, Pro Football Focus, really good out in Vegas. Yeah, podcast that up at 107.5thefan.com. Braden Smith, Purdue, sophomore guard tomorrow. You asked me this regarding the Grammys on Sunday. Who's the favorite, or your favorite artist, JMV, that's never won a Grammy? I guess I wouldn't know. Like, I, I don't know if the Talking Heads have ever won a Grammy. I love the Talking Heads. I don't know if the Cure ever won one. I don't know if the Pretenders. Uh, I don't think GNR, Journey. I mean, I guess there'd be a lot in there that would be my favorites. Thank you for asking. Yeah, I'd be right in there. Let me start at the list at the beginning with that of the Talking Heads. Big fan right here of the Talking Heads. Uh, JMV. I know you like to make fun of the Peacock, but the Peacock is the only place where you can now watch Hope Brady. Shout out. Hey, JMV, you, your conversation regarding the Pacers is right. No more excuses. And, and again, I want to make sure, Jeff, you understand. I'm not at all suggesting that the Pacers are a finished product. But what I am saying is that I want – It's okay to have a vision of what is going to be when you're even better, but also when at the moment in which you feel you're still building. You're still building toward that moment. Just It seems like around here, everybody just says, all right, we know we're going to stink and we're going to stink right now. It does not necessarily have to be that way. When you hear me, for example, get angry, you know, about a bad loss. Like last week, last Friday's show was about that Knicks fourth quarter debacle. That was a very winnable game considering who they were missing. And they just couldn't close it. To me, that was as as bad as what we had seen in some of these games this year. So with the bar of expectation, you talk about being able to win in the now, even though – they're not as good right now as you would expect them to be, I would guess, further on. But, man, you just you got to take advantage of moments, too. That's the other thing. You know, we saw the Colts not take advantage of the moment in which they had. We saw Houston do that. Yeah, backup quarterback or not, it doesn't matter. You saw them do that. Uh, Bill Cash of Stouts Footwear Says, I'm not a big country fan, but Toby Keith seemed like a good dude. Uh, shout out for the show intro. I, I will say this. Toby Keith, to me, and I'm not, I'm not the biggest modern-day country music fan, but when he did narration, I will say this. He had one of the greatest voices of all time. He had a stop-and-listen voice. Like this voice that you hear right now gives you absolutely nothing. Like Jack Squat. Like nobody's going to go, hey, wait a minute, listen to that. But Toby Keith had a voice, and I know a lot of people are going to go, well, wait a minute. But Toby Keith had a voice that was to me in the same neighborhood of stop and listen as James Earl Jones. among the greatest voices, and not for, you know, what they're saying and their opinion. I'm just talking about for what they're reading or what they're narrating or, in the case of Toby Keith, what he's singing. He just simply put had one of the greatest voices of all time. And especially when you do this, you have a great deal of admiration for that. Like I was listening the other day. A friend of mine, Elise, dug up some stuff of mine from our senior year together and I'm narrating this video and I'm going to play it for you. Some, I I have no idea. (laughs) It is so bad. And that's JMV 88. It is so bad, but he just had, again, he had that stop and listen type of voice. Uh, he passed away overnight at the age of 62. I know a lot of country music fans certainly um, are coming together and uh, celebrating that. 
I shouldn't say celebrating the passing, but, you know, obviously celebrating what he brought in a variety of ways as an entertainer. But it was just always, always the voice that got to me. Hey, it was really good to see a little bit earlier, finally, in basically a month's worth of time of not hearing. And, you know, Jim Irsay is a guy that's incredibly active via social media on a variety of platforms, especially that of X, to see him send out or a message from his handle sent out earlier today on the men, grateful for all the messages of love and support. That is the first, I believe, since January the 8th. We have heard from Jim Ursay's X account. That is good. This, according to Jeff Rabjohns, Indiana's without starting guard Xavier Johnson for its game tonight at Ohio State. Gabe Cups, the freshman expected to start for IU against Ohio State. Yeah, it is weird. I brought this up to Brad Spielberger. It's one thing taking the game international, and they've been doing that for a while. It's going to continue. I mean, one of these days, we always say, no, that's never going to happen, but ultimately it does. You know, one of these days, there's probably going to be a team, an organization overseas somewhere, right? You would expect, you know, even with the travel implications for that team and others, but it's kind of weird starting week number one in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And on a Friday, too, I think it's the first time the NFL has had a game to start the season like that on a Friday. It's on a Friday. It's also really odd. Uh, the Eagles are part of that. We have yet to determine who is going to be their competition. Sao Paulo, Brazil to start for the Eagles. And we'll find out who they end up playing with that. All right, 239-1070 is the number. If you guys want to jump on board, you certainly can. Top of the hour, Alex Golden setting the pace. We'll talk about the Pacers later on tonight. NBA trade deadline is coming up on Thursday. Um, I don't have any expectations for it. Some people do. Uh, people are down on Buddy right now. So now you start talking about trade assets and all this. I, to me, think it's dangerous with a guy that has been that good for his entire career at doing something that is at the top of the list of value in the NBA right now to suggest when he goes through a slump that trade him for some sort of asset or a pick or some other jackassery that you're talking about. That's dangerous territory right there with a team that certainly is so reliant upon their offense even with somebody going through a slump. It's not like he's a guy either. He worked to get to where he is. Obviously, a shooting work ethic. At some point, he's going to bust out of that. I mean, hell, maybe it's tonight. Maybe it's on Thursday night against Golden State. At some point, he will. And I like to use this descriptive term, but I wouldn't jack with it. And I asked Chad Buchanan that very question going back a week ago. Do you feel compelled to make a deal because you've got guys, for example, like Buddy, guys like Jalen Smith that have expiring deals? You want to get something out of it. I believe Jalen Smith has a player option on his, right? So do you feel compelled to make a deal because of that? And he said, absolutely, they do not. I, I wouldn't be messing with the offense as much as everybody's excited about at some point in time seeing Jarris Walker Buddy Heald is a three-point maker that's going through a slump right now. And if you're looking for things, if you're looking for weapons, if you're looking for, you know, an attribute that is at the top of the list in the NBA or basketball in general right now, that if you have somebody you can do, you feel really good about offensively, that's shooting the three. I'd be careful with that if I were you. We'll talk to Alex Golden about that coming up at the top of the hour, too. And uh, Luke Bryant tickets coming up a little bit later on. Braden Smith, Boilermaker Guards, coming up on tomorrow's show. I think Bowen's going to be here, too. And then on the road Thursday, on the road at Whiskey Business with NBA Jam and Michelob Ultra. Thank you to Evan and Cluster Truck for the food. And then the thought of remembering our guy James right here, too. James got the cheese bread. I've got the mahi. 
blackened grilled mahi. I'm eating right. Yeah. I've never, I've never really tried mahi, I don't think. Roast, really? Yeah. Roasted potatoes and jasmine rice. See, that sounds good. That's a good deal. That's a healthy eat right there. Is jasmine rice good for you? I think so. I remember living in the 90s, I ate nothing but rice, and everybody said, yeah, you know what, rice is low fat, but then now you get in the 2000s and, you know, like, uh, hell, I don't know, 30 years later, everybody's saying, yeah, you know, all that starch is bad for you, blah, blah, blah. I was just slamming pasta and rice like it was going out of style in the 1990s. What the hell happened with that? Uh, thank you to Cluster Truck and Evan for stopping by with that today, too. All right, your call's on the other side of 239-1070. The Tuesday edition of this show, the AAA Membership Lounge via YouTube Live at 93.5 and 107.5 The Fan. Whoa, you are cute.
Inside the fan. The ride with JMV. It's party time. P A R T. Why? Because I gotta. 93.5 and 107.5. The fan. Alex Golden of Setting the Pace going to join us coming up at the top of the hour. Rockets Pacers tonight. No Fred Van Vliet for the Rockets. Rockets young and incredibly athletically gifted. Pacers beat them in the first meeting of the season on the road in Houston. I mentioned this at the outset of the show. It, I want to see them get a bump in winning and positivity moving up to this all-star break. I know that there's still a long season that does lie ahead. I just want to see them get off and and get everybody together and and get in these these final games before the All Star break in a position where you kind of, right now you, I don't know how much believability you have. I mean, there's a lot of hope, but they haven't given you. They've you know been basically even Steven, as it seems since the Siakam trade. I want them to give you a little bit more than just, well, we hope that things are going to turn around now that's everybody together. I want to see some actual evidence of that. Who's with me? Actual evidence. Starts tonight. Golden State at home coming up on uh, Thursday as well. Golden State goes back-to-back on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, from what I've read, though, I know that a lot of people want to see Steph Curry. I don't blame you. I mean, he's the greatest shooter, arguably, arguably of all time. Certainly, the greatest shooter out there right now. And I mean, hell, when he makes one appearance here in Indy outside of the All Star break, you want to see the dude play. You want to see him ball a little bit. The expectation is you will see him coming up on Thursday, but we shall see. Things can certainly change. I will also say this for the Pacers: you got. Some openings going on. For example, Cleveland is playing some damn good basketball right now. I think they're up to the second spot right now in the East. Much different than what they once were. However, you look at a team like Philadelphia that's going to have to ride this thing out, maybe even long term this season, maybe even for the rest of the season. Uh, but certainly when it matters here in the regular season, Joel B is going to be missing. There is ample opportunity for everybody in the East and certainly the Pacers to take advantage of that. Take advantage of his absence, which is going to have some profound impact on that team without question. So tonight, let's see if they can't get you as the fan a little bit of bump and, and get you off the well everything is even and we're still kind of waiting till you go up to the all-star break feeling like you can't wait till things get started up again with a team that you have a little bit more of a belief in everybody's back everybody's playing Let's see Yakum with this group longer term yeah, I did see Tyrese Halliburton mention. Now, Siakam in a uh, blue and gold uniform is not quite getting to the free throw line as much as he did with the Raptors, which is kind of funny. You know, I love making fun of the NBA officiating. We, I've always been good about that, though. I always thought there were a number of years, and then you could tell, because remember when Sabonis was here, He kind of went from a guy that would just tough his way through it, and we always talked about how he got a major bad whistle. So you could tell he crossed over that bridge to complaining every single time anybody touched him. Now you kind of got that common ground with him. It's funny that Halliburton would bring that up. Tyler Fox writes this, so Indiana's better off without Johnson on the floor anyway. They're more than likely to get a win tonight without him. I think the problem is, too, it's Gabe Cups just gave them zilch against Penn State at home on Saturday. I can't say, though, Tyler, other than just the fact that he's like 25 years old and should be a hell of a lot better, that he probably does bring a little bit more than than Cups. But, um, 
Yeah, I don't know how much you should expect about this team in general on the road at Ohio State. That's a 7 o'clock tip tonight and uh, 6 o'clock, 93 WIBC. Don Fisher with the call. That is a Peacock game tonight. Fox Sports 1 later on this evening in the Big East for Butler and a big one against UConn, the defending national champion. And, of course, we've talked about the Rockets and the Pacers coming at you at 7 o'clock tonight. A little bit more in-depth we go. Alice Golden setting the pace on the other side. And Luke Bryan tickets for his show in September at Ruoff Music Center. Your chance to win is coming up in the 5 o'clock hour. 93.5107 by the fan. I've got a new spot downtown to hang it away. The Ride with JMV. Just when I think you couldn't possibly be any dumber, you go and do something like this. And totally redeem yourself! <laughs> 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan.
All right, I just saw this from somebody named Austin Carp. <laughs> he must be a big deal. Managing editor, digital for SBJ. That's the Sports Business Journal. You guys ready? Somebody had mentioned to me earlier, you know, why do you make fun of the peacock? The peacock is easy. It's got a lot of stuff on it. It's great. And I said, hey, I wasn't making fun of the peacock. I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that both, uh, well, the IU game and Ohio State and Columbus tonight's on the peacock at 7 o'clock. Austin Carp has sent this out via X, ESPN, Warner Brothers, Discovery, and Fox. They are creating a joint venture with the side set to launch a new pay streaming service in the United States that will launch in the fall. This report from Austin Carp suggests that NFL, World Cup, NBA, and other major properties will be on the service. Now, I'm just, out of curiosity, uh, I'm not even novice. I'm below that if there is any such thing in terms of streaming. Like, I go back on my daughter's TV all the time and watch, like, Pluto TV and watch All in the Family and Andy Griffith and 80s Bob Barker Price's rights on a consistent loop, but I really don't get into it more than that. And I did, I did start paying for Peacock when the IU-Purdue game last month was on the Peacock. But I would have to ask you this. For those that have cut the cord and stream, for those that have gone streaming instead of doing what I do and pay a ridiculous amount, a stupid amount of money for direct TV and then have to complain anytime some broadcast entity gets in an argument with them about the money that they're paying or the money that they're getting and then they disappear from my service for about two months. And then I'm like the go-between. I'm like the bargaining chip. So I'm curious, is this a good thing? For you streamers out there? Or is there going to be a point in time when you have so many different services that you're streaming that it's going to become just as large of a pain in the ass as having cable or with me with DirecTV? I'm curious. Because, again, I'm below novice. So please talk to me like I'm like five on this. Because I initially want to go, oh, well, here we go. But, I mean, hell, maybe it's better. And I've told you this before. Me and DirecTV, I'm just lazy. I want to make sure. I want to know that, for example, if I want to watch the Rockets and the Pacers, it's going to be right there. So I'll be turning it on, you know, 671 minus 4, whatever the hell that is. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. And I'm there. I just kind of want to know where all this is. You know, otherwise... I mean, there's no more skin of max in existence, so it's not like I'm paying for that. I do get all, most all the movie channels. But, I mean, hell, I end up watching the same crap. Oh, well, wait a minute. What's on? Oh, Teen Wolf, y'all watch that. Ooh, The Fugitive, that's on, y'all watch that. Oh, The Wolf of Wall Street, I'll definitely watch that, Margot Robbie. Literally, I watch, like, the same thing over and over again. So is there going to be a point where you streamers are going to start getting down because you're paying so much for all these different streaming services. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, again, you explain it to me like I'm five. And I'm sure our next guest will too regarding the Pacers on the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline from setting the pace. Pacers Rockets tonight at the Fieldhouse. Alex Golden is with us. So are you going to be live, local, and late breaking at Gamebridge Fieldhouse tonight? Well, I'll be watching from home, John. <laughs> Good for you, buddy. Good for you. There's no place like, I mean, really, you get to settle in with Chris and Quinn and JJ and Eddie. It just feels like home, right? So it's good. Yeah, it definitely does. And you don't have to worry about how you're dressed either. So you can just be nice and relaxed in the recliner. So, yeah, and then plus, you know, you get the whole bathroom thing, right? So. Yeah, yeah, big big deal. Bathroom thing's a big deal. The older you get, the bath bathroom thing becomes more of a, of a bigger deal. The older that you get. <laughs> hey, did you hear my question regarding uh, streaming service and the one that's about to be launched? That's going to give you know people the opportunity to to get more NFL and NBA. Is there going to become a point in time when those streamers out there are going to view that as the biggest pain as as cable and 
DirecTV or Dish Network, Once Upon a Pine yeah. War. Hear them? Yeah, I heard you talking about it. And I think it's interesting because with so many different streaming options, it's like, well, you have to pay 15 for this and 10 for this and 12 for that. By the time you get everything, you're almost paying more than you'd be paying for normal cable. So I think it's kind of chaotic how everything is going. Now, you don't need everything, and that's one thing that is nice if you don't watch, like, the HBO Max or, or Netflix. You don't have to pay for those. But if you do like watching all that stuff and, and you want to pay for it, then, you know, it's going to end up costing you. Like, people that want to watch the Pacers, you got to pay for Valley Sports. That's 20 bucks a month. So, you know, it just it all adds up relatively quickly. And I know cable packages seem to be kind of on their way out, but at this point, I I don't really know what the correct solution is. But we're uh, I think at some point in the next like ten years, we'll probably see just like one big streaming service kind of take over the industry and buy everything. But I, I think we're a ways away from that. All right. Well, you did explain it like I'm five. I appreciate that. I didn't really know. So I was uh, yeah. I, I just kind of view it and and I'm dumb because I stay with direct TV just because I'm used to it and it's easy. But the cost is ridiculous how much I pay mm-hmm. for what I watch. Yeah. And as I mentioned, I only watch like two or three different things on a, a daily or a nightly basis, and that's about it. So I, I didn't know mm-hmm. ultimately what is going to be the most cost effective for you, considering how many different streaming services everybody's gonna have going here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you can, just get in with a bunch of friends and have everybody pay for one thing and then just share the password for everything, and then you only have to pay for, like, 25% of what you're actually going to watch, and then you just share passwords. I've done that a few times, and it's uh, benefited my, my billfold, but if I was paying for everything, I would be a poor man. Yeah, well, I, mean, I am, too, because I, <laughs> I pay, like, I think I pay, like, 220 a month, seriously. Ooh, for direct TV, yeah. I'm the I'm the biggest dumbass in the world, and I sit there <laughs> and I watch I watch Andy Griffith and I watch basketball and I watch like Teen Wolf and The Fugitive, like that's it, or anything that may yeah. have some like nudity in it. So that's about it. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I mean that's it. That's all I do. Yeah, I'm just a big yeah. waste of money right here. Anyway, I appreciate you trying to handle that question. I talked to uh, Chad Buchanan last week uh, as they approached the trade deadline and with a couple of his answers made it seem like that there was not going to be any activity again after the Siakam deal as we approach that Thursday deadline. Would you agree with that? I think Chad on his his poker voice, I should say, on on the call, uh, doing a good job of not really committing to anything one way or the other, which if you've heard Chad talk, he's very good at doing that and talking around uh, what you know, what the Pacers are going to do, and I think it's smart. I mean, nobody's going to publicly say anything. I know Rick was on uh, the radio this morning, yep. and they asked him about the trade, and he he kind of walked around it too. Like nobody's going to come out and say we're making a trade. So I think that the fact that they have you know 14 guys on the roster, James Johnson is on that 10 day contract. That to me indicates that they are still being active to a certain degree, just because they have left that roster spot, those roster spots open, and that's not something they've done before in the past so to me that kind of indicates like okay they could be willing to make a move here now what kind of move is that it, it might be a small move just to pick up another second round pick or a future second or something like that so that that could be more of like how they're looking at this but i could also see them just uh really weighing their options here before the deadline and, and try to get a feel for what this team could look like because right now with the Halliburton injury and him just slowly starting to work his way back they haven't really got a, a large sample size to at least figure out what this team could look like when fully healthy. Would it concern you more? I've voiced my concern. I I just don't think at any level you can jeopardize this team's offensive output. I just don't Mm -hmm. think that there's a chance it's going to get much better defensively. And everybody knows that. I've I've talked about that. But would you be more concerned about losing, for example, somebody like Buddy Heald absolutely for nothing or more concerned that at some point he's going to break out of this slump and you're going to need his three-point shooting ability, and when you trade him away, or if you did, you wouldn't have that. What most would concern you about that situation? Yeah, I mean, to me, like I, I hate to sound like this, but you really do hate the idea of potentially losing him for nothing. If you look at this Pacers team moving forward with the Halliburton extension kicking in, whatever they sign Pascal Siakam to, this is going to be a team that's, you know, over the cap, but under the tax. So they're going to be limited in what they can do in terms of trades, and they need bigger contracts like Buddy Hill, who's around $19 million 
on the roster moving forward. So if he walks for nothing, that does kind of hurt your ability to do anything in, in, in terms of, you know, getting a trade done without having to piece together like multiple players that you probably don't want to get rid of. So I think that there is some, you know, there is some fear in that. And I think the Pacers, if they were smart, which they are, I think they potentially look for somebody that's got maybe an extra year or two on their deal for around the same amount of money that he's making that, that they could, try to acquire to use in a, in a trade for the future. But, you know, I, I do understand your, your buddy Hill point because he is a prolific three point shooter has been really good in his career. Obviously this year, it feels like a, a big step down from what he did last year, but also you have to look at the times he's been in and out of the lineup. It's just been really inconsistent for him. And he's still, I think like 14th in the league and three pointers made this year. So he's still, you know, doing it at a high clip. He's just not shooting the same percentage number that he was last year. So yeah, you would miss it, but I don't think it's the end of the world because we've seen how they can still win games without Buddy Hill. And defensively, I just feel like, you know, that they have better options there too. So I don't I don't think he's a deal breaker for the Pacers in terms of what they can do because we do know he could break out of this streak at some point or the slump that he's in and go on a hot streak. But I don't think what he does necessarily – is going to move the needle one way or the other for the Pacers. So Alex Golden with us. What are your thoughts on Jalen Smith and his contract and how to deal with him prior to the trade deadline, if at all? Yeah, I, I think Jalen Smith is, is should stay here with the Pacers. I know that there is a player option. He could opt out of that. But it seems to be like he's really grown with this franchise and really seems to like this franchise. And I think he fits in really well. Um, his numbers have been pretty good this, uh, this past couple of weeks here at Pascal Siakam and how he fits. And if the Pacers, you know, were unwilling to put him in that deal with the Toronto Raptors to keep him here, I think that he has to feel pretty confident about his spot with this team moving forward. It's just going to be coming. It's going to come down to what does that number look like in the off season. But I think that the Pacers will probably just find a way to get him back here because they do value what he does. And I think that he is kind of similar to miles where he can spread the floor, shoot the three, I protect the rim. I think he's probably an overall better rebounder than Miles Turner too. Uh, still, still think Miles is a notch ahead of him in terms of overall player. But I think that it's very similar to what to what Miles does, and it's nice to have a player that really kind of mirrors what your starter starting center does. But uh, I, I think the Pacers want to keep him long term. I personally, as a as someone that covers this team and watches this team, I think he's really good for them and what they're trying to do. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that they should not trade Jalen Smith, and I think Jalen Smith should opt out of his player option, and then sign a new contract with the Pacers in the offseason. Yeah, and and the problem you have with that is, I mean, with the three-point shooting ability that we have discovered from him, and, and which he has shown certainly on the floor, that uh, that won't be an easy thing to do because there will be yeah. some teams, I'm assuming, because of what he does now, that will throw a lot of money at him. Yeah, it just it just takes one team to give him a Bruce Brown type of offer, right? I don't I don't see a lot of teams doing that for a backup center, but you know I'm I'm not trying to put the car before the horse or anything like that, JMB. But you know next season it's going to come down to what's going to happen with Miles Turner because he's going to be in the last year of his contract, and things are going to get really expensive with the Pascal Siakam contract and with Tyrese Halliburton on that big contract. So I'm kind of curious what the number will be for Miles Turner if they do you know, find an extension for him either this summer or, or next year after the uh, season's over to find another extension for him. I think that's something to monitor. And Jalen Smith's only 23 years old. So they have Isaiah Jackson on the roster too. If for some reason Turner's number just gets outlandish, you have someone that's very similar in how they play backing him up. That's 23 years old. That I think would fit well with Pascal Siakam and Tyrese moving forward. But like I said, still not at the same level of player as Miles Turner. So uh, how far are we away? We've been without them for really an extended period of time, really over a year since he signed that extension. We've been without mm -hmm. the 33 trade rumors. When will those amp back up again? I would assume at the summer at some point, just knowing he's an expiring. Um, I think that because Pascal said that he wanted to play with Miles Turner because of the way they fit, I think Miles really likes Indiana. So I think that he'll want to stay here. I'm just kind of curious what the Pacers number will be for him. You know, I, I forget what the number was last year, but I think it was like, I know he's making 22 this year, 21 next year, something like that. And he had like close to 37 last year. So it might've been like a $60 million contract. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it's uh it's really interesting. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how much he's expecting to make, but if it's like north of 25 million, is that something the Pacers are willing to do? 
maybe so, but it's just they're going to have to operate as a team that's over the cap but still probably want to stay under that tax, and I think that's where it could get interesting. Yeah, what do you think the number is going to be for Siakam? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually had not looked into, like, what the full max would be for him and how much that would cost. I, I personally don't think they have to do a full max, but I'm not his agent either. So, <laughs> you know, I, I just I don't know what other options are going to be out there for him that he's really going to want to go to. Like, Philadelphia is the only team that feels like a legitimate threat. I don't think he wants to play for Detroit or anything like that. Like, he kind of picked Indiana to be here. So, if they could get somewhere, like, around a four-year deal with, like, you know, an option on the fourth year for the player, like – that could be interesting and maybe not make it the full max. That could kind of help them a little bit with, with that, that room standing underneath the tax. But I don't know exactly. I think that it's really going to be interesting to see what the negotiation is on that contract overall. Is it fair to have any returns of thought right now with this short time Pascal Siakam has played here? What, what do you mean by that? Short returns, thoughts, your returns yeah. on your thoughts on uh, watching him play in the short time yeah. he's been here. Is it fair to come to any – or draw to any conclusions right now? I, I got you. Yeah, no, I, I think it's. I think you can say he fits in pretty well. I mean, you d- you definitely want to see more of a sample size with with him and Tyrese and uh, him and Miles and Tyrese and and honestly the starting five they had in Charlotte. I think that could be their starting five moving forward. This this Pacers team has had not had a lot of you know starting five or five man lineups that have played a lot of possessions together. I think the I looked it up the other day and in terms of possession wise, if you look at the Pacers bench unit of McConnell, Matherin, Buddy Hill, Obi Toppin, and, and I believe it was uh, Jalen Smith, maybe Isaiah Jackson. That five-man lineup was like 90th in possessions played this year, and that's the most frequently played, or that's the most uh, played lineup of current players on the team. So they definitely need to get their reps in to kind of get a better feel for what they can be. But just seeing how versatile Pascal is at the three, can play the small ball five, has a little bit of an inside-out game. I think we really saw him be more assertive in that game against Charlotte. We saw him be really assertive against Philadelphia a couple of weeks ago. I think he's going to fit in just perfectly fine. So uh, I think it was a great trade. Didn't really give up too, too much for him. And I think he's going to be a great piece moving forward, especially when Tyrese could tell you they're really going to click, and I, I think it's going to be something special to watch. Alex, did you hear Halliburton mention the fact that the whistle that Siakam has received here in a blue and gold uniform has not equated to the once-received whistle he got north of the border? Did you hear that? <laughs> I did hear that, and it's and it's kind of funny because I think the Pacers are like, 30th and fouls called for versus fouls, uh, you know, fouls committed, like minus 5.9, something like that is what I saw from StatMuse. So that does say a lot. The Pacers don't get a lot of foul calls and they get called for a lot of fouls. Now, granted, this defense early on was so bad, they were fouling like crazy. And so that does kind of, you know, tip the scales a little bit. But, yeah, I, I definitely think Pascal's not getting the same whistle, which is a little bit interesting. But I, I – I don't know. Maybe it's just the blue and gold. It just it turns uh, the officials off to giving us foul calls. I mean, that's a, there's a reason why Rick Carlisle got ejected in that Denver game a few weeks ago. <laughs> I, like the, I love the old woe was me. I, I, I brought this up. The early stages of development for Doma Sabonis around here. You just remember, that kind of transformed him into the after every whistle or lack thereof complainer that we know him to be in Sacramento now was the mm-hmm. awful whistle that he got in the early stages of his development here. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, you'd look at his arms and he'd have cuts and blood everywhere and get no foul <laughs> calls. He'd like point to his arm bleeding and tell the official, they're like, oh, it was a clean block. He's like, really? Okay, thanks. You know, and I, I get why he was frustrated. You can tell uh, Matherin is probably one of the best at drawing fouls on this team, but even this year it's taken a bit of a dip and he's constantly looking for foul calls. Now that does – wear on me a little bit because it's pretty much every time he drives and misses, he's complaining for a foul. So that's like the boy who cried wolf. But, you know, sometimes I feel like you have to do that just to kind of get the ear of the official and, and hopefully they'll pay more attention to it next time and give you the benefit of the doubt. He is Alex Golden of Setting the Pace, talking Pacers, Rockets, Pacers coming up later on tonight. 6.30, your coverage begins. After a bit of a segment of Anything Goes right here on The Fan, uh, you brought up Miles a little bit earlier. I said this last week, and actually, once I said it, they ended up shutting him down on Friday. I can't remember. I think it was an ankle, but I know he's been dealing with um, you know, back strain or whatever. I know he works consistently before the games to get him ready um, uh, with the uh, trainers in massaging and, and getting him ready. He, he hasn't looked right to me. 
and he hasn't looked right since the Embiid game. And I don't, I know he's cleared and he's good to go for tonight. But have you seen the same? Is it more about the back he's dealing with, or more that he looks a little bit out of gas as we approach the All Star break? Yeah, I mean, he did play in the Suns game after the the Sixers game, but he only played, I think, like close to 14, yeah. 17 minutes, something like that. That was not a shining moment game wise this season <laughs> for him. No. No, and, and to be fair, it's just not a good matchup being out there with Kevin Durant at the five. Like, that's just not a good matchup for Miles. So that's why you like seeing Pascal be able to play the five. Obi Toppin had a great game there. So, you know, that's that's one game. But then he did not play against Memphis with the back, came back against Boston, and he didn't look too bad against Boston. I thought he played pretty poorly against the Knicks, maybe his worst game of the season. Just really got abused down there down low. And when Rick Carlisle put him back in the fourth quarter, I just had to pull him out pretty quickly for Jalen Smith. And then he missed the next game Friday and so did Jalen Smith. So to me, I felt like miles has looked a little slow as of late. Um, but even I, I had people ask me at the beginning of the season, like, does miles look a step slower to you? Does he just now look like he's reacting as quickly? And I, and I kind of understand that because his block numbers are down a little bit too, in terms of his rotation, it seems like he's a, like a half step slower, but I do know that the wear and tear of like playing so fast and playing so many possessions probably does wear on a bigger body like that. So it, it's probably incredibly hard to keep a seven foot body in shape to be able to run up and down the court for 30 plus minutes a game, the, the pace the Pacers play at. So I give him a lot of props for how he's kind of transformed his body into being able to, to keep up with that. Cause he definitely did trim down a little bit, got a little bulkier, but uh, up top, but he uh, Jalen Smith did the same thing because they were both a little heavier uh, on the lower part of the body. So I think that they've really tried to get their bodies in shape to play this style, to play the Pacers want to play with. So, you know, I just think with Miles, it, it could just be he's ready for the All Star break. He's been in the league for nine years. It's a lot of wear and tear on the body. So, uh, I, I'm not overly concerned with him. But yeah, I think that at this point, just kind of pacing himself and not getting himself re injured is, is huge because this Pacers team is going to really need him. Yeah, uh, I, come down to the stretch. I I just he he to me in that next game looked like until they sat him on the bench in the final three or four minutes or so on the fourth he. He looked like he was in pain. I mean, he looked like yeah. there was something that was paining him, and he was he was. I mean, Hart, Hartenstein has been good against good bigs this season for the Knicks, but Miles didn't look. He looked like he was nailed to the floor. Mm. Yeah, and if you go back and look at how Miles played against Hartenstein, the previous matchup, the day that the Knicks traded OG or for or they traded for OG and Anobi, yeah, I thought Miles actually played really well in that game. So. With him missing the game the, the the next night against Sacramento with the ankle injury, definitely may have tweaked that during that game. I I'm not sure, but you can definitely tell like the back the back problems probably didn't go away. It's just something he's fighting through, and that could also be part of it. So uh, Alex Golden of setting the pace. What are your thoughts on the Rockets? No Van Vliet later on tonight. I haven't seen any at least updates as far as the Pacers tonight or anybody else for the Rockets. Pacers won that initial meeting in Houston. What are your thoughts about tonight? Yeah, I think it's going to be a tough game. Like, Houston's very defensive-minded with Ime Udoka there. I think that Fred Van Vliet not playing does give them a bit of a break just because he's so good. But, you know, you can't overlook the fact that they have other players that are capable. Amin Thompson uh, will probably get the starting spot for him. And Amin Thompson, I think he was the fourth overall pick in the draft. You know, a really good athlete. Cam Whitmore, someone that fell in the draft, has really kind of stepped up and played some big minutes. I know Tari Eason is out for the Rockets as well. And Tari Eason was someone that I really liked in his draft class, really good defensive forward uh, that can really cause some problems. But I just think that, you know, this will, this will be an interesting matchup, I think, for Miles too, because Shin Goon is very good with his footwork down low. And I think sometimes those type of bigs have given Miles problems before. So we'll see how he matches up and if he's healthy and good to go. But I think that Houston will – be a be a tough game, but I think Indiana will pull the victory out tonight. All right. Final word here with Alex. Anything done Thursday or remains the same for the Pacers? What's your call? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that they're going to be looking. I, my gut says they're probably just going to stay pat and not make any drastic moves. If they do anything, like I mentioned earlier, it'll be a smaller move, maybe to pick up an extra asset, take on a, a contract that fits into their – uh, fits into their system. Maybe it's a minimum contract type thing. Like they're helping facilitate a trade like they did last year with the with the Nets and the Suns and the Bucks got involved. So I could see them kind of playing part in that. 
I would be a little bit surprised if they did uh, did end up moving off of Buddy Heald and Obi Toppin. But uh, Dustin Dopier just tweeted that Benedict Matherin is out tonight. It's a stomach issue. Yeah, I just saw so that I think too. That, yep. that does play a factor, I think, into how this game plays out. But I still think Indiana gets the win. Man, you go from a toe, you come back, and now you got a stomach bug. Yeah, man, what a bummer. Yeah, yeah and he was... looked really good in Zach, against Sacramento. I mean. That was the good Benedict Matherin that we've seen so far this year. I'm uh, I'm excited to see what he does, though. I, I think Matherin is such an interesting player at overall, JMV, just in terms of how he fits with this roster moving forward. I think he can be, like, really, really good and maybe that third guy next to Siakam and Halliburton. But it's just going to take some time. I just I feel like he's got to continue improving on being a more consistent all-around player to really get the full trust from the coaching staff to – kind of unleash him and let him be that starting two guard moving forward. Do you um really quickly before I let you go here, I, I'm not yeah. a big fan of any Wiggins trade rumors with the Pacers, are you? Yeah, I'm a little intrigued by it only because, like I mentioned earlier with Buddy Hill's contract, like Wiggins does have a few more years on that deal. And if you can kind of recoup his value, like it, it does make some sense. I know he's not played well in Golden State. Golden State's been a hot mess all season long. I know last year there were some issues with Wiggins missing games and I think it was family related. So you know, he's kind of had an up and down year, but we saw what he could do when he reached his max level of play in that NBA Finals for the Warriors. Like, he was the second best player on that team. So, there is still some intrigue. He's still young enough in his prime. The contract's pretty, pretty high in, in dollar. I think he's around $24 million this year, but I think his last year is like in 2026 is when he would become a free agent. That's around like $30 million. So, it does get a little bit hefty, but I just think about it this way. If you're in a playoff series – who do you trust out there more defensively, Buddy Hield or Andrew Wiggins? And if you can kind of make a deal like that, to me, it, it would be worth the risk a little bit just to see what it's like because I still think you could eventually move off of him the next season if it doesn't work out. So Alex Golden setting the pace. You got something new and fresh up there, I'm assuming, right? Oh, yeah. We just did a, uh, a two-parter podcast on, on trade ideas. So me and my co-host, Mike Focci, we went back and forth sharing different trade ideas mostly centered around Buddy Hill and Obi Toppin, uh, just seeing if there was anybody out there, anything out there that we thought, okay, this can make some sense. So nothing like crazy for any stars, but a lot of role player trades and just trying to see if, you know, we could throw anything at the wall and it would stick. All right. Uh, Alex Golden, check it out. Setting the pace, the podcast. Alex on the Andy Moore Automotive Group Hotline. Appreciate you, man. Enjoy the game tonight. Hey, thanks, JMV. I appreciate it, and uh, we'll talk soon. You got it. The Rockets and the Pacers tonight, and no Benedict Matherin. A stomach bug wasn't feeling well when he arrived at the arena. That, according to Tony East, no Benedict Matherin for the Pacers, and no Fred Van Bleet for the Rockets tonight. 7 o'clock to tip, 6.30 coverage right here. Follows Anything Goes, which we will get to coming up at the top of the hour. Luke Bryan tickets in the next 30 minutes. Listen to win as well. 93.5107 by the fan. In order for small businesses to...
hammering a bacon, egg, and chi, hold the chi in preparation to go deep with four hits and put on a laser show to the likes of which you have never witnessed in your entire life. 93.5 and 107.5, The Fan. Nick writes this, JMV, the amount of streaming services my wife and I already have, that's a pain in the ass. <laughs> you know, I'm 54, and I just don't want to have a pain in the ass. That's true. And I've tried to be this, and I have tried, and I have failed. But I maintain a level of try. I try to be as hassle-free as possible. I know you guys can't believe it because it sounds like I'm a whiner and crier and a pisser and a moaner every single day right here. But I try to be as hassle-free as possible, which is impossible, don't get me wrong, at whatever age, unless, eh, I don't know, you're 10. I'm thinking basically single digits up, um, what, up until you're about 14 or 15? So, yeah. I do feel your pain. Fowler writes this. You go to 671 minus four. That got me. Yeah, that's how I find Bally Sports, Indiana. 671, which is Bally Sports Midwest. And I think minus four will help me find Chris and Quinn and JJ and Eddie Gill. Mm -mm -mm. I have no idea what the channel is. I tell my mom the same thing, 671, like minus. I think it's minus four, maybe minus three. I get the smarts real good, everybody. James T. writes this, JMV, I still would like to see the Foo Fighters and ACDC for a Super Bowl halftime. Yeah, I, I think the time has come and gone for ACDC. You'll probably still see at some point. The Foo Fighters do it again, I would imagine. Who's doing? Who's the uh, Super Bowl talent this year? It's not Usher, is it? It is Usher, isn't it? I think so, yeah. yeah. Who else is with Usher? Look that up. I'll have to look it up, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, <laughs> it's I think we're basically trending back to cable. I think you guys are. You think there's going to be at any point where, like, I, I'm sitting in the penthouse going, see, I stuck with this direct TV product, and it's still the best option. Which clearly right now it isn't. Hey, JMV, not a fan of expanding NFL games worldwide. As a season ticket holder, somebody is losing 11 to 12% of their home games, depending on whether your team has eight or nine. I know it's all about money. How much is enough? Uh, that's from Ted Bishop down at the Legends in Franklin. Shout out to Ted. I think the the common answer or the most often given answer would be it's never enough. I think we kind of I think we kind of take that in terms of the film Wall Street. It's never enough. When is enough enough, Gordon? How many yachts? Can you water ski behind? And it's never enough. Especially not with something that just, I mean, you snap your finger and they're just making money hand over fist. Whatever, whatever product they offer out out there, we, uh, everybody goes running. So, yeah, that the answer right there is it's never enough. So it is interesting. This conversation came because I, I had given you this Austin Carp, I think it sent this out via X, Sports Business Journal earlier that ESPN, Warner Brothers, Discovery, and Fox are creating a joint venture with the side set to launch a new pay streaming service in the United States that will launch in the fall. NFL, World Cup, NBA, other major properties will be on the service. I think if you have ESPN+, Plus, Hulu, and something else, you get it. But I was wanting you to inform me as if I'm five, and I am. I'm not very smart in terms of this subject, not really anything in general, but certainly this subject matter. If 
That's good for you lovers of the stream. Bad. Tiresome. Still much better to be there than direct TV or cable. Just kind of curious for you streamers out there, the impact that that will have on you. Just a thought. All right, 239 1070. We do have time for some anything goes. That's coming up here at the top of the hour. Uh, we will get you to the Pacer pregame show. Mark Boyle, Eddie Gill, Pat Boylan coming up at 630. Rockets and the Pacers. No Benedict Matherin. A stomach bug is the cause tonight. No Fred Van Bleet for the Rockets tonight either. 239 1070. Bill, up first this afternoon. Bill, welcome to the show. Hey, JMV. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I just wanted to get your opinion on on Matherin and, and in the Rising Star game. I mean, he, he I haven't watched a whole lot of the, of other teams uh, in the NBA, but uh, uh, I'd be surprised if he didn't get the MVP because he's he is really really coming on. It seems like uh, uh, this this part of the year. So I, I want to see him, a more consistent Matherin, the more consistently good Matherin, because I think we all like that. I think it's easy to really like that. And we know that he has it in him. So, yes, the consistently good Matherin is what we're all looking for. So, so it's going to be interesting to see him in the, in the all-star yeah. game. Yeah, and, and I will and, say uh, this, too, though, Bill. To be fair with this entire team, we want to see a much more consistent product. That's why I mentioned at the beginning of the show, it starts tonight for me. Get a bump going into the all-star break where it's not just hope around here, right, Billy? It's a belief. Right. It's a belief that you got something. All right, you get everybody together right now. I know Matherin's not playing tonight, but normally you get everybody together. Give this this fan base a reason to to not hope, but to expect, you know, after the All Star break, this team to kick a higher gear. And I think it's definitely going to happen. And you talk about kicking a high gear. Business is going to be good down at Whiskey Business on South Oh, Road Yes, it is. Thursday. Yes. So we, and and I'll tell you what, and they've got some all stars on that staff as well. So I will see you there. <laughs> All right, Billy, I appreciate you. Whiskey business is coming up on Thursday, and it will be an absolute blast. I promise you that. Michelob Ultra and NBA Jam High Score moves on to the finals. High Score wins the shoes. And it's interesting if you're watching via the uh, AAA Membership Lounge YouTube Live right now, um, the shoes aren't like this. These are my. You know what? I want to be cool and hip, but I'm really kind of an old dude right here. These are my old dude. You guys are – look at my old dude Nikes. This also is good because if you go to anything to where you have to dress up and you don't want to put on the dress shoes, you can wear these right here and get away with it. But these are not the shoes that you will win. Nike Air courtside. You get that courtesy of Michelob Ultra. They're awesome. You can win those with the high score coming up on Thursday. Whiskey business on Southport Road. Yeah, no, those are kind of old dude shoes. Well, I'm an old dude. Guilty as charged. Uh, JMV collectively losing billions in streaming and trying to hang on. JMV, I pay four with ads and pay $90 less a month than I did with 120 channels plus HBO. And I maybe watch 15 of those 120. I pay somewhere in the neighborhood of 220. I forgot. I did add one thing. I watched the uh, Destination Channel on Saturday mornings. They have a marathon of uh, barbecue pitmasters. Oh, and that basically aired between 2010 through, I want to say 2018, maybe. Myron Mixon is one of the greatest smokers of all time. The greatest meat smokers of all time. No, Myron Mixon. And I love watch. I don't know why. And I've seen them all a thousand times. Barbecue pitmasters. I do watch that. Uh, JJ's in Muncie. Hello, JJ. JJ, are you there? As always, fly the W, baby. You know, right? How are things going in Muncie today? 
Not too bad. Not not too bad. Everything's slow and low. The women, uh, BSU women are playing very good, very good, making a move. So not too bad. So what's my right. what's what's my what's our guy Michael Lewis doing up there? You know he's still he's still staying competitive in the MAC. A bid to the NCAA would be tough, but yeah, you know I think he's a very seasoned and smart coach. Definitely one to keep around for a while as he's uh, developing players right there. He is a good dude, no doubt about that. What do you got, JJ? Okay. Real quick, Daymar, Daymar, Daymar. We don't do that. We'll say that for later. <laughs> I, got four, I got four quick things for you. One, with Peacock and Hulu has live sports. No disrespect to Hulu, but can you say football? Blah. That's not football. Uh, so, the, the soccer is prominent there? Is that what you're saying? Uh, it's, it's, we'll call it football, soccer. Okay. But it's not football. So I'm, I'm with you on the whole Peacock and Hulu, although I do have both. And, it's, and nowadays it seems like it's tough that you have to have it for some strange and apparent reason. But I'll tell you, I was looking for the Purdue Northwestern game, and it was not on Peacock. Gotcha. JJ and Muncie, my man, I appreciate you. Oh, I, yeah, you got it. I, yeah, hey, JJ, I tell you what, put him back on hold. I'll, I'll get him up coming up and anything goes. Look who is here on the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline, former Mr. Basketball, standout Center Grove, Golden State Warrior rookie, IU standout, will not be present at Center Grove West to watch Rick Clark shoot air balls tonight. <laughs> uh, Trace Jackson Davis joins us. Big fella, how you doing? I'm good. How are you guys? We miss you down there. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Man, this it's so- hard. It's hard not to be playing. I mean, like watching them and just knowing that I had another year, but at the same time, you got to go. So, what what have you seen out of this IU team? That I mean, it, obviously you were there long enough and did so much to know. Besides the obvious output you gave and and Hood Shafino gave, what are some of the things yeah. they're missing right now that you would like to see maybe they add and they can add within the team that they have right now? Um, I think they have a good core, um, a solid group. Um, obviously, you never know who's going to leave, what's going to happen, but um, definitely need another guard. Um, that's definitely high on their list. But um, other than that, I think that core, they definitely – have what it takes to I think they're a lot better than what they've been showing I mean obviously X goes down again um Malik gets hurt Khalil gets hurt they haven't had really a full deck so I don't really blame coach and obviously me losing me and Jalen Miller race it's hard that's that's tough to do you lose four scores um in the Big Ten so but I think yeah the guard guard play definitely especially not knowing what's going to happen, either transfer portal or recruit someone. So, But I think that's the highest thing that they need. I know that you're concentrating as a rookie playing at Golden State on the road all the time and, and honing your, your craft. But uh, have you noticed here, especially recently, all the heat that's coming on on your coach, Mike Woodson, in Bloomington? Is that something you do notice that comes along yeah, with I've the noticed, territory of I dropping mean, games? I, I, I get it. Um, at the end of the day, that's just – it's Indiana in general. Um, the thing is you can't really, you can't build something if you fire someone every two to three years, it's just, it's not going to happen. It's impossible. And so I'm not, I don't think he's that worried, honestly. Um, can't, especially if he makes a tournament twice. I mean, we were second in the big 10, second or third last year. We made the tourney twice. We're one game away from, Big Ten championship tournament game, and then yeah, so like you can't just he's put on he's done what he's needed to do, but obviously in a down year, next year is going to have to be big. But I think that they'll regroup well. So Trace Jackson Davis, rookie Golden State, Golden State in town coming up on uh, Thursday against the Pacers. How's that going to feel to return home, family, friends to watch on Thursday? Uh, you play at Cambridge Fieldhouse. Oh, it's going to be great just being at home. Um, Seeing the fans, seeing my family, seeing everyone, being in familiarity of everything. Um, hopefully, hopefully I get to play. We'll see. Um, it's, it's up and down, so it is what it is. But just if my name gets called, just going out there and playing as hard as I can. 
I, mean, I was watching last night. What? Why are you getting a lot of playing time, and then all of a sudden that that disappeared? Is Steve Kerr? Has he conveyed to you the reason why you're kind of out of the rotation? No, it's a, just mostly just um, obviously um, Draymond's back, um, Loon, Dario. Um, it's just it's just the pecking order basically. So I just got to wait my turn. Um, they, they're really high on me, and so. Um, just have a positive attitude, and sometimes guys get in foul trouble or um, they like the matchup, and so uh, they'll throw me in there. But um, just always being ready is the biggest thing for me. But overall, yeah, I trust Coach. Coach is doing a great job with my development and everything of that nature. And so um, just doing what doing what I need to do, um, practicing and stuff of that nature, and just always being ready. Is it tough to be patient? Uh, definitely different, but um. I think that I've I've handled it well. Um, yeah, I think overall I've handled it well. It's it's different. Obviously, going from playing at IU, starting every game, playing 30, 35 minutes, to playing maybe 10 to 15 to not playing. Um, it is what it is, but um, I'm making the most of it. Um, blessed to be in the situation that I'm in. I thought if Trace Jackson Davis joins us, that that was the best place for you of any of your options coming out of IU. Has it turned out to be that way for you? Was that your belief going in, and is your belief right now justified? No, it, it was. Uh, Golden State was definitely my my number one where I thought that I fit in the best. Um, I, love, I love Golden State. But, um, other teams that I was really high on were uh, Brooklyn, um, Pacers, um, there's a few other teams. Sacramento. Were you disappointed when the Pacers didn't go at you when they had the opportunity? Um, yeah. So the thing about that on draft night, my agents actually they were like working behind the scenes, but they didn't tell me anything, and so I was just in the dark and just thinking because basically my slot was twenty to forty. That was where my range was, and so when we got to like thirty, I think pick thirty-five. Um, my agent shut it down and said that no one can take me unless they offer me a, a deal, like a guaranteed deal. And Golden State was the only one that was offering it. And, like, there were three times where a trade fell through, and it started at, like, 35, and then they finally got it on the last one. So it it was what it was. But at the I was upset, not just at the Pacers, but all the teams that I was talking to. And, um, yeah, but it is what it is. No, so man. No, yeah. Golden State. Yeah. yeah, if I would have known that, then I would have probably been less stressed. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and again, it, it worked out great. I mean, it worked out great for you where you are right now. I mean, hell, you get to live in, you know, in San Fran. You get to watch, you know, a guy like Steph Curry work his craft. You get to know how you know hard you have to play to maintain yeah. at that level, too. I mean, a lot of things that uh, that do you a great deal of service in your rookie season in the NBA. No, absolutely. Just being around, like, it's crazy. Like, we have four Hall of Famers on our team. Like, Chris Paul, Steph, Clay, Draymond. They're all going to be on the Hall of Fame. And just being able to watch them work out, being able to talk to them, just uh, pick their brains about basketball, being a sponge, it's not only just going to help me a lot in the long run. Man, I'm so happy for you. Seriously. I absolutely enjoyed your time at IU and I try to tell everybody that it's unbelievable that as talented as you are you're an even better dude. <laughs> I mean it is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um how many of the uh, CG folks and friends are going to have down there Thursday? There's going to be a lot um I know my, my mom's side of the family I got a lot of she has a lot of, she has like six or seven sisters and then obviously Kevin and then um so they'll all be there, and then their family, and then I got friends that have all texted me about coming to the game. And so I just can't wait to see everyone. It's going to be great. That's, uh, I was playing with Kevin last week, and he said, hey, are you going to call Trace? And I said, yeah. You, you Like, now? <laughs> now? He said, yeah, now. Let's call him. So, 
Nah, man, you got a good group. You really do. Kevin Kevin is honestly one of the best guys ever. So I can see where you got oh, yeah, all that great. from. You've had great He's positive great. impact. Um, but uh, no, we're all very happy for you, man. Seriously. And uh, we get a chance to spend some time, come back and hang out with us. And uh, you, too, can witness once again the greatness of Rick Clark shooting up air balls on Tuesday night in the uh, West. So I'm going to I'm gonna have to come for a reunion soon. You want me to shoot some video of that tonight and send it to you? Yeah, you should. <laughs> Hey, buddy. Fantastic job so far. We'll see you on Thursday. And uh, tell everybody around you we said hello, man. Keep on keeping on. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. You got it. It's Trace Jackson Davis, Andy Moore, Automotive Group Hotline. Uh, way over. We'll come back. We'll recap that. Get you ready for some Anything Goes coming up here after 6. 93.5107. Five the fan. At Bet365, we don't do...
The Ride with JMV. Look at all those ding-dongs. 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. All right, uh, my thanks to the Warriors and Trace Jackson Davis for joining us. Truly is one of the best dudes you will ever meet. I mean, one of the best dudes you will ever meet. And it's good to see. I want to see him get more time. But it is good to see him really happy and and obviously fitting so well into future plans there with Steve Kerr and Golden State. Trace Jackson Davis, podcast 107.5thefan.com. Hey, I owe you this. We've got some Anything Goes After 6, and I've got Luke Bryan tickets to give away coming up here in the final segment. 239-1070, Anything Goes, and your chance to win Luke Bryan tickets coming up. 93.5107.5 The Fan. Watch parties aren't what they used to be. Ride with JMV. The Sportos, the Motorheads, Geeks, Sluts, Bloods, Wastoids, Dweebies, they all adore him. They think he's a righteous dude. 93.5 and 107.5, The Fan. Yeah, Skypoint to Toby Keith today. 
Passed away late last night at the age of 62, a long battle with cancer. The uh, country music artist, just one of the greatest voices of all time. Just voice in general, one of the greatest of all time. Uh, Braden Smith joins us to Purdue, the sophomore guard, on tomorrow's show. Uh, Trace Jackson Davis podcast, 107.5thefan.com. Thoughts on IU, their struggles this season post-Trace Jackson Davis, and that's uh, the position of Mike Woodson from Trace Jackson Davis, plus the fact that um, he's he's fit well. Now, he was out of the rotation last night. Golden State was uh, at Brooklyn, and obviously here coming up on Thursday. Uh, it should be a strong family and friends rep from those at Center Grove for Trace coming up on Thursday at Gambridge Fieldhouse. All right, so many things goes. Luke Bryan tickets to give away a little bit later on, too, so listen to win. 239-1070 until about 623 we go. And then we'll get to the Pacer pregame show. Rockets Pacers tonight. Mark Boyle, Eddie Gill, Pat Boyle, and have you covered coming up at the bottom of the hour. Jonah on Anything Goes with the lead right here. Hello, Jonah. Hey, JV. How are you? Hello, Jonah. Go ahead. Well, it's raining out here, so I know that's not something you hear very often for, for Arizona. Now, it's raining in Arizona right now. Will you go to the Waste Management Open in Phoenix this no, weekend? But- no, but as an Uber driver, part-time Uber driver, I'm going to make a lot of money. So I'll be going there, but not going there. If you so, know what I mean. okay, if you're an Uber driver in and around the Waste Management Open, what is the percentage that one of those usual, utilizing your service pukes in your car? Uh, well, you know what? I've been doing Uber for four years. I have never had anyone throw up in my car. No, really? I know I'm lucky. No, yeah, and I, I know, JMV, I know I'm lucky in saying that, too. What is all right? Tell me this: of all the Uber drivers out there, what do you think the percentage is of Uber drivers that have had a customer puke in their car? Oh, high, very high. I mean, I because I use Uber a lot when I go to the airport, and I, I ask the same question: I'm like, "Hey, I'm an Uber driver as well. Uh, how, how often do you have someone throw up in your car?" It's like, "Oh, multiple times." And I'm just thinking to myself, "Man, I am one lucky son of a gun." Man, well done out of you right there. Yeah. Now, do you have a no puking policy? Um, no, I just, if I, if I know that somebody is under the influence, I just like, Hey, look, dude, if you're going to, if you feel like you're going to throw up in my car, just let me know. I will pull over on a dime. Gotcha. That's well done right there. I, like I had an incident once in a cab and, um, I, I actually, um, and I was lucky this was back in the nineties and we were prominently back then, Jonah, we wore turtlenecks. And I didn't have any place to go. The windows wouldn't roll down, so I just basically pulled out oh, pulled out the turtleneck. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then, no, and nobody ever day. knew. It was like nobody knew. So it was the, the the it was a I guess a fantastic fragrance because nobody knew. It was just like yeah, I pulled out the turtleneck, got it done, went back, and it was like nothing happened. It was beautiful. Hey, I commit. I commend you for that one. Now, I didn't have a close call. I, a girl did yak outside my window, but she was like, hey, you know what? At least I didn't throw up in your car. I'm like, I'll give you two thumbs up because that was, that was great self-awareness on her part. <laughs> Jonah, what do you got? So I was going back to what you said about the Pacers, about being selfish, about yes. how they should, if it's win now. or You know what? Let's be selfish. But let me tell you something. I had – I graduated high school in 2004. I had season tickets that year, and we all know what happened in 2004. And I had season tickets for seven years after that. And it was just dark times for the Pacers. And then there was the 2011 to 2014 window where I I thought it was going to be a good future from then. But then Lance Stevenson left, and Roy Hibbert just unexplicably just fell off the cliff. So I feel like with this year's team – I, I, I'm okay with the win now mode, but at the same time, I still feel like they can build on it because they actually have assets, and they didn't really give a lot of away. No, I, listen, I, I've said this for, before, for Jonah. Theocracy. Yeah, hey, Jonah, I believe this. I believe that you can have the eyeball on being better than what you are right now in the future, but I also think part of that future and growth is about winning right now, and that's been my expectation. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, build build up wins and see if we can get in the playoffs and get these young guys some playoff experience. I mean, we still have Shepard, 
Walker, Jackson, that barely – I mean, at times they don't even get off the bench. And that's – I mean, that's a good problem to have. And I'm, I'm loving this – I'm loving the growth of this team right now. Yeah. And I, I want to see them here in these final games before the All-Star break. I want to see them give Pacer fans a reason to go beyond hope into expectation. If you know what I mean right here. I got, like right now it's hope, but I want to see it beyond hope. I want to see a little bit of expectation. The Waste Management Open is in Phoenix coming up this weekend, and Jonah is in Arizona as an Uber driver with uh, literally a no-puke policy. It's so well done, Jonah. Uh, Will is up next on Anything Goes. Hello, Will. Hey, John. Had a- it's the first time on Anything Goes we've ever discussed puking. Well done by us. Go ahead. I have a question and a comment. The question is, have you – are you going to have? Did I miss Doug Bowles on? Are you going to have him on to talk about uh, the Carb Day concert? And do you have any idea who it's going to um, be? I I I've been sworn to secrecy right now. Um, that but doesn't yes. mean anything to me. <laughs> I know, I know what it means. I know what it means. It's funny that uh, we off the record had a conversation today when they announced that he's going to come in and we're going we're going to drink and uh, have some beers and and talk it up. I just don't think that they're ready right now to make the announcement. Well, I don't think he'd be very happy if you were to tell me right now. <laughs> yeah, probably not. I <laughs> I am just loving music like that. I'm very interested in how how they have to pull all this together. So I, I really I like to be just be kind of a fly on the wall and listen to these guys discuss things and hey, this is what's going to work because it's more than just our musical tastes or interests. It is, you know, routing. It is a ninety day rule around here. Um, it, you know, a monetary figure. It's all of that kind of into one right here that uh, is to me makes the process incredibly entertaining. Is he when is he coming on this week? You said or next week? Do you know? Um. It's probably not going to be too long from today. So, and the, the the comment I have is you you say a word really weird, and I want to ask you about it. You just say the word L O T T E R Y. You kind of can you combine the word loiter and lottery into loitery. Loitery. You do that on purpose? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Have you noticed you do that? Ah, I, 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 sometimes I've been. P- people ask me, "Are you trying to go back to your your Southern Indiana draw?" Or are you trying to talk like you're, you're English? What are you doing here? So I just think that that's that how it happens. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good show. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. You call any time. So lottery? Loitery? Is that what he said? Loitering? Yeah. I, I think you guys know this. I mean, you've had me around for 19 years that sometimes I just can't get out of the way of southern Indiana. I just can't. Like I still, there are words that I specifically stay away from. Like there's no way. Like if I'm Matt Bear across the hall and I'm doing WIBC traffic, if there is an accident at Keystone and Rural, I'm screwed because I can't pronounce Rural for nothing. Zero. So. I get tripped up on that, and that is being from where I'm from in Greene County. However, one of these days, I will make privy to you the lost, the forgotten, and recently located tapes of my May of 1988 final senior day of high school in which I narrate a great deal of it. And I have literally the worst voice in the history of voices. It is awful. And I'm not making a lot of because I can't. It is awful. How they didn't say, all right, so you're going to come to Vincennes as a freshman and you want to be in the broadcasting program and your dumb ass sounds like this? Are you serious? Well, you got to find something else to do. And I think that may have been the world before Walmart greeters. I know Walmart was around then, but man, there literally anything else other than what you believe is going to be your career path. It was that bad. I'll play that for you. <laughs> it was like 
it was like uh, it was a mixture of southwestern Indiana backwoods southern draw with a lisp. I I ask my friends all the time I grew up with. I say, how did you guys not say? Listen, if you talk anymore, you're going to make us all sick. Would you quit? BTR is at 239-1070. Hello, BTR. JMV, don't knock yourself from being a Hoosier. Uh, I I have I'm no, North, I, the North worst North. voice of all time is what it was. I'm Northwest Hamilton County. and uh, But that was an awesome interview late on the draw with uh, Trace Jackson Davis. Yeah, he's he is uh, literally, he's as good as they get. He is. He would hang out with you, talk with you, and um, you know, just to be that talented as he clearly is. And yeah, they just they don't make him much better than him. He's he's a really good dude. I think his talents has really transitioned well with Golden State um, to the NBA too. Yeah, um, yeah. Hey, he's in a, he's in a great spot. And listen, we maintain when he got drafted, even going late in the second round, that he was in the best spot for him, and and he concurred a little bit earlier with that. So that is a great spot, even if he's not getting clock right now, which he didn't last night. And you know, to me, that's a bit inexplicable considering the transition. He mentioned you know Kayvon Looney getting time, and he's not right now. I kind of wonder about that. But they're still in trying to win now mode, even though they're about ready to embark on a a major transition with a roster of that team. But uh, they like him enough where it appears he's going to be a big part of it moving forward, and that's good. I'm going to move way off the barrel. That's the reason I called. Yep. Um, February 24th is the first spring training game for the Cincinnati Redlegs against the Cleveland Guardians. Yes. What do you think about our Redlegs this year? I think we got to hold them to a higher standard, more than just falling in love in early summer and falling in love in June. I think it's time for them to put together a consistent product. That's my expectation. We've picked up some pitching, hopefully, that will right. pan out. Yeah, and normally with the Reds, that's always been considered famous last words. But, yes, they did yes. hard target. <laughs> it, it is a hard target of pitching. No. I just thought last year, especially in June, they had a month period that I just thought was an appetizer, a bit of a taste as to what we should expect from them this year, and I'm going to. Just stay healthy and be good. Yeah, they were they were like that that month last year was as enjoyable of a Reds team that I have watched and stinking forever. Now it was short lived, but it was exactly. as enjoyable that I as enjoyable of a time that I've had in a while. And I I want to see a longer more fulfilling version of that. That's my expectation this year. Sustained. You yeah. got it, buddy. BTR. Right, thanks, Gamby. You call anytime. Thank you. No, anything goes. Uh, we have Luke Bryan tickets coming up before we bail out of here, too. Uh, keep in mind, uh, across the hall, 93 WIBC, you've got IU on the road at Ohio State. Television-wise, that's a peacocker. Radio-wise, Don Fisher, Eric Soar, and John Herrick have you. Tip time is at 7 o'clock from Columbus tonight. Butler coming up tonight. I believe that's an 8.30 start for Butler on the road at UConn. Greg Rakestraw described this for the dogs as house money playing. Seriously, though, they win this game tonight, and you would have to have an absolute disaster the rest of the way not to make the tournament. A win tonight would seemingly etch an NCAA tournament bid in stone that even any committee in the world put together, because we know this, if a committee is put together, it's going to screw something up. Not even that committee would screw it up. So playing with house money is an awesome term. Dogs later on tonight against UConn. 
Uh, Jim's up next at 239-1070. Jim, welcome to the show. You know, JMV, this is probably the first time I've called in 20 years, and I'm almost a little disappointed I'm calling in because I'm going to bring up the topic of Indiana University basketball. Oh, that's a bummer right there, too. Yeah, not much good to talk about there. I don't I don't know how to – I don't even how to formulate the question. I, I feel bad for the program, and, you know, but the, the, the argument is with the talent level that they have currently, you know, pick a good coach. Uh, doesn't matter. Um, fill in the blank. Can they or can a coach or a staff cause this group to win two, three, four, five more games in order to just even get to the day? I, I really – I don't think so. I think the – I don't know who to blame if it's on the recruiting end, but the notion of playing the collegiate game without a perimeter, uh, does that fall on Woody, the prior folks? I, I – I'm, I'm beside well, myself. Well, yeah, I mean, you heard Trey. When Trace was on here earlier, he mentioned, you know, transfer portal and guards, and basically that's what it comes down to. You know, swinging and missing, you know, the kid down in Tennessee from Harvard that, you know, puts it up from distance right. at will. I mean, you saw everybody else. I mean, like Marcus DeBasque with Illinois, you know, a guy that can shoot it. You know, Lance Jones with Purdue, a guy that can shoot it. A lot of other teams found that in the transfer portal, and, you know, IU either thought that Xavier Johnson was going to be that guy or felt that they had it covered, and they were incredibly wrong. Does Woody have another year? And if so, I don't think – because who's going to come now? I mean, you, you, you roll – if they if for some reason the, the faithful decide to hit the eject button on Woody, who, who – you, you, you got to go big. Uh, I, I mean, I, honestly, I, I'm, I'm, I, I really am, you know, as a – Longtime fan, and I know you are too. I, I, you know, no one's going to call me for my opinion, but I don't know where they go. Yeah, I and, really don't. Hey, Jim, you call any time, man. It's great to hear from you. Twenty years is a long time. Um, Mike Woods is going nowhere this year. He's going to get another year. Extremely hot it will be next year, but he's going nowhere this year. You know, regardless of what is what has been going on or what might continue to go on here that's the expectation tonight yeah as far as a a future coach I mean there are a lot of things you know people thought that bringing in an IU guy was going to bring everybody together initially it did but uh, it's gone basically nowhere fast here this year and and the problem is that you, you ostracize with the way this team is playing going back to Saturday the fan base that you know, unless you do something next year spectacular, you're never going to have them believing in anything. So that's the problem you create right now, even if you're not on a fire at the end of the season hot seat. And you heard Trace mention about it. You know, you can't continue to go four years and fire and four years and fire. Hey, Fulton, I got to run here really quick, but I wanted to get you on the air. What you got, buddy? Hey, j and I got to tell you something real quick. Um, so I just want, um, it was my first uh, year anniversary of my work at Texas Roadhouse. There, my man. Hey, Fulton, I got to run. You call again. Congratulations. Make sure you come to my uh, tournament this Saturday. <laughs> Fulton, my man right there. Thank you, Fulton. Congratulations on your anniversary. Luke Bryan tickets. Number 9, 239 1070. Luke Bryan, September Ruoff Music Center. Number nine is going to go on us at 239 1070. Greg Rakestraw, Alex Golden, Brad Spielberger, PFF, and Trace Jackson Davis. Golden State Podcast 1075thefan.com. We'll take a break. Mark Boyle, Pat Boyle, and Eddie Gill from the Fieldhouse have you coming up next. Rockets and Pacers on 93.5 and 107.5 The Fan. Have a great night. Enjoy.